Some sign on one more address of your emergency. Somebody please send a police. My niece okay, killed her baby. Please. <laughs> what is the address? Uh, 5957 Wildwood. Okay, ma'am. Lord, help me. Welcome back to another episode of Killer Bites, the show giving you bite-sized coverage of true crime stories. My name is Allie, and today I'll be telling you about the highly disturbing and gruesome slaying of three-month-old Janiah Watkins. This case contains detailed accounts of the murder and might be one of the most gruesome and disturbing cases that we've covered. This bone-chilling case started with a troubling 911 call. A distressed man's voice is heard speaking to a police dispatcher in the recorded call. It's clear that he's panicked and distraught and we're about to find out why. What, what, what do you see when you look at the child? What look, look, lady, I don't want to describe the scene. The screen is very, very bad, all right? The little lady, the little baby head is open, like okay. open, open. I, I'm, I'm not going in there to touch nothing because I don't want to mess nothing up. I'm not going in there to look because I already seen it, but it's not, it's very violent. It's a very <laughs> violent scene. This man, Robert, had just arrived at his mother, Deborah's house and stumbled into her kitchen to find a terrible scene. As Robert tries to convey what's happened to the dispatcher, he's heard saying that he doesn't know where his little cousin is. Well, come to know that his little cousin is a young woman named DeAsia Watkins. And as the dispatcher tries to make sense of what Robert is trying to tell them, the horrifying picture begins to come into focus when the dispatcher asks what happened to the three-month-old baby. That's when Robert is heard saying, Lady, the baby is on my mama's kitchen counter with her head smashed. And just a warning to our viewers, this case is only going to get a lot more graphic and disturbing from here, so please watch with care. Robert begs the dispatcher, now I need you to please send the police. And as he tells the dispatcher this in the background, you can hear a woman wailing and crying, saying, she's dead, she's dead. That woman will later be identified as Deborah, Robert's mother. And then the dispatcher is heard desperately trying to make sense of what happened between Deborah's cries and Robert's limited description of a deceased three-month-old baby, a call that no one ever wanted to get, let alone relive. So what happened? How did this innocent three-month-old soul meet such a horrible and untimely end? Well, to explain this unsettling case, we'll have to first go back in time a little bit to where it all began. On December 14th, 20-year-old DeAsia Watkins and her boyfriend James Brown welcomed their healthy baby girl, Janaya Watkins. It was a happy time for the couple. Everything seemed to be on the up and up for James and DeAsia. DeAsia was excited to become a mother, and she wanted to give her baby girl a much better childhood than the one she had experienced. And because of that fact, DeAsia was determined to give her child all the love she never received. That's why no one could have predicted the dark and gruesome events that would take place over the next couple months. Things began to take a dark turn around January 25th, 2015, at midnight when police were called to DeAsia and James' apartment. Multiple neighbors had called the authorities and reported hearing DeAsia screaming and Janiah crying. So what happened? What could have caused such a scene? Well, when police arrived at their apartment, DeAsia refused to open the door. But when officers threatened to force their way into the apartment, a young man that police would later identify as Chris Gully, James' cousin, opened the door. And what did the police discover when they arrived? Well, the first thing they noticed was a strong smell of... They also noted that DeAsia was not acting normal. Her behavior was erratic and strange, and fearing for Janiah's safety, the officers tried to take the baby away from DeAsia. But when they did, DeAsia snapped. When the officers tried to take the baby from DeAsia, she would not let go of the child, and instead, she attempted to choke Janiah, who at the time was only seven weeks old. After the incident, welfare check-ins were issued for both DeAsia and Janiah. During these checks, the social workers were able to take Janiah from DeAsia. Once Janiah was safely removed from the new mother, DeAsia passed out on the floor. After that incident, DeAsia was moved to a psychiatric facility for care and was put on a 72-hour investigative hold. And it didn't take doctors long to establish her diagnosis. So what was the cause of this erratic outburst? The following day, DeAsia was discovered to be suffering from postpartum psychosis. Postpartum psychosis, also known as PPP, is considered a mental health emergency. And according to one definition of the diagnosis, it's a condition that affects a person's sense of reality causing hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, or other behavior changes. In severe cases, people with PPP may attempt to harm themselves or their newborn. And clearly, when DeAsia tried to strangle her child, the doctors determined she was suffering from this. Fortunately, this condition is treatable, and early treatment is said to increase the odds of a good outcome. 
but still, this is a very serious condition since the life and well-being of a baby can be at stake. Doctors move forward with putting Deja on antipsychotic medication to treat her PPP, but due to side effects of the medication, she was informed that she would have to discontinue breastfeeding Janiyah. And beyond Deja's ability to nurse her baby, healthcare workers expressed concern to Deja's caseworker that she didn't seem to be grasping the seriousness of the situation. According to Deja's case notes, her care workers felt like she was minimizing the incident by implying it was no big deal. But regardless, by January 30th, Deja was released from the hospital and allowed to return back to her apartment with her baby. However, the hospital did put a strict safety plan in place to keep Janiyah safe. So what did this safety plan include? Deja was only allowed to have supervised contact with her baby Janiya, but this was under the condition that Deja took her prescribed medication. The safety protocol also stated that James or his sister had to be present at all times when Deja was with Janiya. So was Deja on board with all these modifications and rules? Well, a visit from a caseworker revealed that she was not willing to commit to the safety plan completely. It turns out that Deja hadn't filled the prescription for her antipsychotic medication, so the caseworker reiterated that it was imperative that Deja take her medication. This care worker reinforced that if Deja did not take her medicine, it would not be safe for Janiyah to stay in the home with her. Aside from the caseworker's concerns, James also feared for the safety of Janiyah. He made it clear to Deja that if she did not comply with the safety regulations, that she would have to leave their home. And since the apartment lease was under James' name, he had the ability to kick her out. With the pressure from the caseworker and James, Deja reluctantly agreed to their terms. After all, Deja was desperate to not be separated from Janiya. But in addition to her love for her daughter, she also confessed that she had nowhere else to go. So was this the end of these disturbing events? Unfortunately, it was just the beginning. One week later, a caseworker made another unannounced visit to the residence. And at the time of the visit, the caseworker was unable to verify if Deja had gotten her prescription filled or not. Unfortunately, over the next couple of weeks, things only went further downhill. By February, Deja had moved out of James's apartment and into a house with her Aunt Deborah. And for a short time, baby Janiyah was in the safety of her father's care. But on March 6th, the couple's custody proceedings began. Because of some murky circumstances, it was discovered that James's name had been left off the birth certificate. Therefore, he was required to do a paternity test to gain custody. Similarly, because of Deja's mental health issues, she still needed to be evaluated again before she was allowed to have custody over Janiya. So both parents were not allowed to assume control over their baby. And because of this situation, Deborah, Deja's aunt, was given custody of the young child. Due to the ongoing court proceedings, neither James nor Deja were allowed to visit their child, and while they both agreed to the terms, things did not go as planned. During the caseworker's visit to Deborah's home, she confirmed that Deborah told her she was not allowing Deja to visit, but that it wasn't the truth. In reality, things were not what they seemed, and Deborah was not telling the truth about everything happening inside her home. So what was going on behind closed doors? Well, Deja had been spending time with Janiyah, and not just a little bit of time. Deja had actually moved into her aunt's house and had assumed taking care of the baby again. Now this was clearly in contradiction to the court order and what the doctors had recommended because of her PPP. But nonetheless, Deja had found a way to be back with her young baby again. See, Deja had moved into Deborah's house just days before the court order. And at the time when Deborah was given custody, she was also suffering from personal issues and health problems. Therefore, caring for a baby on her own was just too much for her. So with few other options, Deborah allowed Deja to stay in her home. But unfortunately at the time, this caseworker didn't know any of this. On March 16th, 2015, just three days after the caseworker's visit to Deborah's home, this truly horrifying and vile murder of poor Janiyah would take place. A dispatcher received an intense 911 call early on the morning of March 16th. On the call, Deborah is heard saying, she's not supposed to be here, Robert before begging the dispatcher to send the police. After that, Deborah is heard breaking down into sobs and incoherent ramblings, leaving the dispatcher confused about what happened. Deborah is heard hysterically yelling, Lord help me, in the recording of the emergency call. That's when the dispatcher asked to talk to the person Deborah was speaking to before she answered the call. And that's when Deborah says the most haunting thing. My son, he came over here, he found it, I was asleep. So what did Deborah's son Robert find? That's what the dispatcher wanted to know too. She's heard trying to reason with Deborah to calm down, but when that fails, the dispatcher takes a more harsh tone with Deborah. And finally, she was able to get Deborah to calm down enough to explain that her son Robert had come over to her house, woke her up, and told her that baby Janiyah was dead. Then Deborah is heard screaming, Oh my God, I'm going to jail. And after that, quickly passes the phone to Robert. 
Robert is able to more calmly tell the dispatcher that he had arrived at Deborah's home just minutes earlier with his children. And unfortunately, it was his youngest child who had arrived in the kitchen first, and it was that child who saw the grisly scene in the kitchen. Seeing what happened, Robert had immediately ushered his kids out of the house to safety. He then re-entered, fearing the worst for his mother, Deborah. He told the dispatcher that he found Deborah asleep in bed and told her what happened. He then tried to find DeAsia, but couldn't locate her. But not quite grasping the scene, the dispatcher got firm with Robert and told him, Okay, I need to know what happened to the baby. That's when Robert panics and tells her that he doesn't know what happened to the baby, that he came into the house and the baby was on the counter. Then he continues saying that all he did was wake up his mother, Deborah, and call the police. That's when the dispatcher asks, is the baby breathing? To which Robert replies, listen lady, the baby is deceased. I can't imagine being on the other end of that call and hearing those words. What a haunting and horrible thing to have to witness and then try to communicate to someone. Minutes later, the first two officers arrived at the scene. One officer quickly made his way to the kitchen and confirmed that baby Janiah was in fact dead. Meanwhile, the other officer found Deborah in the bathroom. That's when the two officers radioed to other officers to assist on the scene. Amidst the chaos and confusion, the officers began to clear the home, meaning they checked to make sure no one else was inside the house. And while they were clearing the house, officers located DeAsia. So where was she when they found her? Well, DeAsia was in her bed in her room, tucked under her covers. When officers entered her room, it was a mess. A broken lamp, books on the floor, and clutter everywhere. Seeing DeAsia in bed, officers pulled the covers back, and without a word, DeAsia was handcuffed and moved to the hallway. DeAsia remained under the watch of another responding officer, and the rest of the home was cleared without any other incident. But Deborah and her family could not remain in the house while the police did their investigation, so the family was moved to the criminal investigation section, where they were put in interrogation rooms. And this is where the details of what happened in Deborah's home would start to be revealed. A video of Deborah and Robert shows them walking into an investigation room. In the footage, Deborah can be seen crying hysterically and repeating, they might as well kill me, Robert. Robert tries to console his hysterical mother, telling her, you ain't done nothing wrong. Deborah continues to unravel and yell out for help, to which Robert replies and tries to get her to calm down. But Deborah continues to scream and cry on the tape. Finally, the detective tells Robert that he has to leave the room so they can question his mother. Reluctantly, he leaves her and Deborah lets out another cry. Deborah's screams and cries can be heard all the way into the next room where DeAsia had been placed to wait for detectives. On a police videotape of the interrogation room, DeAsia is shown humming to herself while she waits to be questioned. The hum is haunting and almost childlike. She shows next to no emotion. Could she be in shock? Perhaps, or maybe in the clutches of an episode brought on by her PPP? It's hard to say, but it's not what someone would expect from a mother who just found out their baby was murdered. Meanwhile, in a nearby interrogation room, Deborah is inconsolable. She continues to say that she doesn't think she can live through this horrible situation. And while the detectives try to calm her down, she can't be comforted. The stark contrast between the two women's reactions to the tragedy is disturbing. Nearly two hours passed before detectives finally came into DeAsia's room at the police station. And in the video, DeAsia can be seen remaining stoic and seemingly unfazed by the horrifying reality that her baby is dead. In fact, DeAsia calmly waits for detectives with her head on the table. When the two detectives enter the room, one of the detectives asks her, Are you Dee Dee? Clearly a nickname for DeAsia. The detective introduces herself, but DeAsia barely lifts her head off the table before putting it back down. Her movements seem oddly young and detached. The detectives run through a gamut of different strategies and tactics to get DeAsia to speak, but she remains silent. Even when detectives read DeAsia her Miranda rights, she still said nothing. Detectives try and ask if DeAsia understands what the detectives had read to her, but it's clear she's not going to speak. Not only is DeAsia silent, but she barely moves her head or body to acknowledge a detective's presence in the room. They try to ask her if she's okay or if she needs anything, but DeAsia remains hauntingly still and devoid of emotion. Determined to get some kind of response from DeAsia, the detective scoots her chair over towards DeAsia. She stares her right in the eyes and tries asking her simple questions like how to spell her name, but nothing the detective does seem to snap DeAsia out of her catatonic state. Lastly, the detectives plead with DeAsia that they want to help her. They repeatedly tell her that they can't help her if she doesn't talk. The detectives try both soft and firm tactics, but nothing is working. You can see in the video how desperately the detectives want to get answers from her, but DeAsia will not relent. Finally, the detectives have no choice but to abandon the investigation and simply retain photos and her clothes for evidence. Shortly after the detectives leave DeAsia, a new team arrives to take photos of her. 
They tell her to go ahead and stand up, but she refuses to respond. So finally, the detectives order someone to make her stand up. An officer helps DeAsia up and photos are taken of her. Then the officers retain her clothes in another room as potential evidence. DeAsia is then returned to the confession room in her new clothes, but despite all this interaction with the investigators, DeAsia still refuses to speak. After the detectives re-enter, they run through the entire book of interrogation tactics again, but all prove to be ineffective to get DeAsia to respond. And after six hours, they've gotten nowhere with DeAsia and the meeting comes to an end. After the detectives were unable to get any information from DeAsia, she was transported to a psychiatric unit where she once again received treatment for her PPP and was kept for observation. Three days later, DeAsia is returned to the station to meet with detectives again, which is just three days after baby Janaya was found dead in Deborah's home. But this interview goes a lot different than the previous one. In the video, DeAsia appears to be slightly more animated. And when asked by two male detectives if she's handcuffed, Deja immediately responds, which is already an improvement. The detective then offers to take the cuffs off Deja. This time, when asked if she's right or left-handed, Deja answers right away again. So things are already off to a much better start for detectives. And it's clear even Deja's demeanor is in stark contrast to the previous interview. Once again, the detectives read Deja her Miranda rights. And this time, Deja signs the form that she understands her rights. Wow. Quite the difference in just a few days. And after some general questions, the detectives begin to work towards untangling the web of lies that led to an unthinkable horror. The detectives start off by telling her that they are going to ask her some simple questions about her life before the incident. The detective then says, what I'd like to do is just go back, okay? He then proceeds to ask DeAsia about her history with James and how they became a couple. The detective presses on asking DeAsia about the apartment she shared with James. The interview begins to take a turn when the detective brings up the January 911 call at DeAsia and James's apartment. When asked if DeAsia remembers the incident, she tells the detective that she does not. The detective responds again asking, you don't remember that very well? DeAsia continues to say no. And this would be a common answer throughout this interview until it was not. The detective pushes forward, determined to get to the bottom of what happened and what kind of circumstances would ever lead to the death of a newborn baby. The detective asks again if DeAsia remembered being at the psychiatric hospital in January, but she continues to tell the officer that she does not. Three days earlier, Deborah was asked by detectives about DeAsia moving into her house. In this interview, Deborah was assisted by her sister Cindy because she was so distraught. Cindy described the circumstances that led to DeAsia coming to live with Deborah. She said that DeAsia had called her Aunt Deborah crying and asking to be picked up. So Deborah went and picked up DeAsia and let her move in. Meanwhile, in DeAsia's interview, the detectives clarify with DeAsia that Deborah in fact did come to her apartment and help her move out. And DeAsia confirms this chain of events, therefore effectively going against the court orders. The detectives try to clarify with DeAsia about this fact. You were staying there while all this stuff was happening with the courts. Again, confirming that DeAsia was there despite being ordered not to be. DeAsia again says yes. Then the detectives ask a question I was curious about too. They ask her why James wasn't on Janiyah's birth certificate. You remember this is why James was not granted custody of Janiyah. The detective asked DeAsia if James and her had a fight that led him to be omitted from the birth certificate. DeAsia explained that he had an ID that had expired and since it expired, the hospital supposedly said they couldn't put James's name on the certificate. And due to this issue, James had failed when he filed for custody. A simple mishap that could have prevented a horrible tragedy. So much of what happened later might have been prevented if James's name was just on that birth certificate. Next, the detective tries to get information about DeAsia's medication. He asks her if she was on medication when she went to stay with Deborah, to which DeAsia says she was in fact not taking it. The detective then asks were you supposed to be taking medication? And DeAsia admits, yes, that she was supposed to be on medication. Meaning DeAsia knew that she was supposed to be taking her pills for the PPP. Again, DeAsia went against court orders. The detective then asks DeAsia why she didn't want to take her pills. DeAsia tells the detective that she just didn't want to take them. The simplicity in the answer is so childlike. Detectives ask DeAsia how long she was staying at Deborah's house before Janiyah came to stay. To which DeAsia says, two weeks. The detective confirms then that the court gave custody of Janiyah to Deborah, and DeAsia confirms this chain of events. And while it's clear that the cops suspect DeAsia of being complicit in the crime, they gently try to lead her in that direction, 
Clearly, they're afraid to scare her back into silence. Three days earlier, in the interview with Deborah, Cindy, Deborah's sister, explains on Deborah's behalf that during the court case for custody of Janiah, she spoke with a lawyer. And by the time she came back to speak with her sister Deborah, she found out that the court had convinced Deborah to take Janiah. Cindy said she told Deborah that she would try to help with the child and that Deborah was hesitant to take on the responsibility for caring for Janiah, but that she also didn't want to see the baby go into a foster home. But it was clear that Deborah didn't feel like she was equipped to handle the full responsibility of a newborn baby. And maybe that was why she made a tragic decision that she would later come to regret forever. Cindy explains that Deborah got custody of the baby, and that even though she knew DeAsia was not supposed to be near the baby unattended, she let her take care of the child. Back in DeAsia's interview days later, DeAsia is heard saying that she broke the court rules because she missed her baby. Then detectives really dig into what led up to that fateful event in Deborah's house. The detective says on the night that police came to the house, Deborah had already explained that she gave DeAsia the baby, and DeAsia agreed that this is what happened. So when did things go wrong? The detective asks DeAsia if the baby was asleep in the crib or the bed the night of the tragedy. DeAsia answers that the baby was in a crib in her room. The detective then says they had found a broken lamp in her room, and he asks DeAsia if she knows how it got destroyed. But DeAsia says that she doesn't know how the lamp broke. Finally, detectives say that obviously at some point something bad happened with the baby. Then he finally asks if DeAsia remembers what happened, but DeAsia simply says no. The detective then asks DeAsia, how did the baby get into the kitchen? To which DeAsia says, I don't know. During this whole interview, she remains calm and her voice is soft and childlike. It felt like the detectives were interviewing a little girl around eight or nine and not an adult woman. Then the detectives ask DeAsia if she thinks her aunt did something to baby Janiah. That's when DeAsia finally says, yes. Well, that's a twist and not what we were expecting to hear. The detective says once again, so you think it was Aunt Debbie? And again, DeAsia says, yes. So detectives ask her, what do you think she did? And DeAsia calmly says, killed her. The haunting lack of emotion is completely chilling. Detectives realize that DeAsia and Deborah were the only two women in the house when Janiah was killed. So detectives now had to figure out what exactly happened and who was ultimately responsible for the horrible crime. Detectives momentarily explore the possibility that Deborah could be guilty. They put together that perhaps Deborah's dwindling health, mixture of her own medications, and the responsibility of caring for a child could have caused her to snap. In Deborah's interview, she is heard saying, I can't live with this on my conscience. Now these could have been the words of someone who is guilty of a terrible crime, or someone who broke a court order that could have protected Janiah. And detectives were determined to figure out the truth. In DeAsia's interview, detectives asked her how she thought Deborah killed her baby, to which she replied, stabbed her. Then detectives asked if DeAsia knew what Deborah stabbed Janiah with. DeAsia then says that the knife was in the baby's hand when she saw Janiah. This fact becomes very important later on. Detectives ask DeAsia to clarify, so she repeats that the knife was in the baby's hand. The detectives ask DeAsia if she saw the baby, but DeAsia says that she didn't see the baby, which is clearly a contradiction to her previous statement. Things were not adding up for the detectives. How would DeAsia know about the knife if she hadn't seen the baby? How would DeAsia know how Janiah was killed if she hadn't seen her? The detectives then asked DeAsia to fill in the holes in her story. They asked DeAsia to explain how Janiah went from being a healthy baby to being injured and dying in the kitchen. DeAsia tries to blame the incident on her aunt sleepwalking. Well, that clearly doesn't seem like a reasonable explanation of what happened. And it doesn't appear the detectives think so either. This is where the detectives get tired of entertaining DeAsia's stories and finally begin to really dig in to figure out what happened to young Janiah. They tip their hand, revealing that they know DeAsia had the knife in her hand, and slowly reveal that they have found her fingerprints on the weapon. But despite the evidence against her, DeAsia continues to deny that she hurt her baby. Even with evidence right in front of her, DeAsia will not admit to her crime. And detectives realize that evidence against DeAsia will not be enough to get her to confess. The detective then takes another angle with DeAsia, explaining to her that Deborah was asleep when Janiah was harmed. And he goes on to say that Deborah also had no blood on her hands or her body. And then the detective asks again if DeAsia thinks Deborah is the one that hurt Janiah, and DeAsia says yes. But detectives are not convinced. Not getting where they want to go, the detective finally asks DeAsia why her clothes were covered in blood. The photos the detectives had taken of DeAsia days earlier showed that she had blood spots all over her clothes, face, and body. Again, the detective tries to persuade DeAsia to confess, but she does not. So they scrap a logical approach with DeAsia and try a more emotional one. 
The detective is seen asking DeAsia, do you know the difference between a bad person versus a bad thing? From a psychological perspective, most people consider themselves to be good. So if you can get a person to separate what they did from defining their character, then perhaps you can get them to confess to a crime. And that appears to be the angle the detectives are employing here. Detectives double down telling DeAsia that there are bad people out there. Then he goes on to say, there are people out there who are not bad, but who do bad things. This honestly seems like a line out of a movie. But there's a reason why this tactic is used. It can be effective. The detectives stress that there's a big difference between bad people and people who do bad things. And the detectives then double down saying they're just trying to find out what happened. They then ask, do you think something was going on that caused you to do this? Clearly, the detectives were trying anything to get DeAsia to confess. And it seems to work. DeAsia is heard saying to the detectives, they were just trying to take my baby. The detective clarifies, people were trying to take your baby from you and that upsets you. To which DeAsia says, yes. The detective continues to DeAsia, so you thought if you did this to your baby, then nobody could take it away from you. DeAsia replies, I didn't do nothing to the baby. And again, DeAsia denies her part in Janiya's death. So detectives then try a new approach with DeAsia. The detective tells DeAsia, I don't think you wanted anything bad to happen to the baby. Then goes on to ask DeAsia if she agrees that something very bad happened. They explain that what happened to the baby was caused by someone with very deep feelings. Detectives again try to implicate that DeAsia is to blame for this crime. They then plead with DeAsia saying that if she could help another mother who also suffered like DeAsia did, wouldn't she want to do that? They then add, you know Aunt Debbie didn't do this. Then the detective says to DeAsia, do you just not want to believe that you did it? To which DeAsia replies, yes. This is a clear breakthrough for the detectives, but it's beyond heartbreaking to witness a woman who is suffering from mental health issues to try to grapple with this horrible situation. And it's beyond tragic that it all happened in the first place. Detectives then ask DeAsia what happened that made her so upset the night that Janiyah died. They ask her once again how she ended up with so much blood on her. The detective tries to dig in deeper with DeAsia's loved ones, hoping that some mixture of tactics will get DeAsia to confess to the horrible crime. The detective tells her that while he doesn't think she's a bad person, he does think she's responsible for a bad thing. And he underlines this statement by saying that all the evidence points to DeAsia killing her baby. He then goes on to say that DeAsia needs to accept responsibility and deal with the consequences of her actions. The detective pleads with DeAsia to confess so that the family can move forward. Finally, the detectives state, Aunt Debbie didn't do this sleepwalking, did she? And DeAsia says, no. Then again, he asks DeAsia, what set this off? What happened? Clearly, the detective is trying to uncover the spark that caused the massive explosion of violence that ended in the death of baby Janiyah. Finally, DeAsia gives a different answer. The answer that detectives knew, but still it was haunting to hear. DeAsia says that she took baby Janiyah into the kitchen and killed her. And thus, all the denials stop. Detectives finally have their confession. But why did this happen? Detectives push DeAsia further to get more answers. And detectives get the full picture of what happened when DeAsia finally agrees to describe the horrible events. Once again, we do want to give a warning to our viewers that it's an incredibly graphic and disturbing account of events. DeAsia goes on to tell the detectives that she took Janiyah to change her diaper, and at that point, Janiyah started screaming and crying, so DeAsia said she couldn't change her. And instead, she threw Janiyah across the room. DeAsia says that Janiyah didn't die with the impact, so she picked up Janiyah and banged her head into the bookshelf four times. Then she says she picked up a stick and hit Janiyah in the head four times. But DeAsia says that her baby was not dying fast enough, so she says that she went into the kitchen to kill her, to finish her off. She then recounts that she took a knife and stabbed her in the head. DeAsia says that she told Janiyah to die, die, die. Then she says she stabbed her in the eye, but the baby was still twitching, so she says she just cut off her neck until she died. After this horrifying confession, the detectives ask DeAsia how many times she had cut Janiyah to get her neck severed, and she simply says, until it sliced off. The other detective follows up asking DeAsia why she needed to both stab and cut off the baby's head, and all DeAsia says is she wouldn't die. The detective asks how DeAsia knew that Janiyah wasn't dead, and DeAsia says because she kept breathing and moving around. Then he asks DeAsia what she did with the knife, and DeAsia said that she put the knife in Janiyah's hand. And when the detectives ask why she would do that, DeAsia replies, so that it would look like she did it. Then detectives ask DeAsia what she did after that, to which she replies, I went back to my room. And horrifyingly, DeAsia's account of events was consistent with the evidence the police found at Deborah's house. But detectives still didn't understand what could have prompted DeAsia to commit such a horrifying crime. 
The detectives ask Deja, what made you do that? And all Deja can say is, I don't know. They then ask Deja if she feels bad about what she did to Janaya. Deja answers, no. After that, Deja was arrested. But the question of why this happened was never really answered. The only reasonable explanation that some could draw was that Deja's PPP remained untreated and thus caused the outburst. And according to the Hamilton County Prosecutor, Health and Family Services did their jobs. The prosecutor's office said they followed court orders, finding a relative to care for Janiah and checking on her multiple times. But clearly social workers didn't know that Deja had moved into the aunt's home about a week before Janiah's tragic murder took place. In Deja's initial plea in response to her aggravated murder charge, she pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. But the presiding judge ordered that she received psychiatric treatment, and it was later determined that she was competent to stand trial after receiving the required treatment. However, a trial date never came. In February of 2017, Deja pleaded guilty to the murder of Janiah. She received a sentence of 15 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 13 years. The tragedy of this case is apparent. It's awful that something so gruesome could happen to someone so young. And we want to extend our compassion to the family that endured this horrific chain of events. That's all I have for you today. My name is Allie and thanks for watching Killer Bites. One summer day in 1995, a six-year-old girl named Morgan was taken out to a ball game by her mom. After finally getting permission to go play around in a sandy spot by the parking lot with some friends, Morgan went missing. Or as some would say, she was taken out at the ball game. No one's really sure what happened or why, but over 25 years later, Morgan's disappearance remains a mystery. And in honor of baseball games, we are making Chicago-style veggie dogs. On June 9th, 1995, Colleen Nick decided to take her six-year-old daughter, Morgan, out to a Little League baseball game for a girl's night. And what was supposed to be a fun and eventful evening full of mother-daughter bonding and grubby baseball food, quickly turned into Colleen's worst nightmare. I'm gonna start off by heating up some beer. So Colleen and Morgan lived in the town of Ozark, Arkansas. The game was actually about 30 miles away in a town called Alma, and the main reason they went was because Colleen was invited by one of her friends who had a kid on the team. Colleen had three kids in total, but her two other kids were a little too young to go to the game, so she left them at home with her mom. Once they got to the field, Morgan sat in the stands and watched the game with her mom. She was approached by two of her friends, Ty and Jessica, who asked if she wanted to go play with them, but she told them no and said she wanted to stay in the bleachers. But over time, Morgan started to lose interest in the game, and her mom was chatting it up with friends, so she started to get restless. I feel like it was an interesting choice for Colleen to take her little kid to a baseball game. Sports games can be pretty tedious for some kids and adults. Anyway, Morgan was sitting there just trying to find something to entertain her. She got so bored that she literally tied and untied her mom's shoelaces for fun. It really be like that sometimes. So now that our beer is bubbling, we are gonna place our hot dogs in the beer. So Morgan determined the Little League game was boring. But finally, Ty and Jessica came back and asked her if she wanted to go catch fireflies with them. Honestly, Morgan was desperate to find a way to escape watching these little kids flubbing the ball, so it was perfect timing. Also, catching fireflies sounded really exciting to her. But Colleen didn't think it was a good idea because it was dark outside, the game was almost over, and she had never been to this stadium before. After much begging and pleading from her daughter and reassuring words from Morgan's two friends who claimed they would all be safe, Colleen finally caved and agreed to let Morgan go play. Morgan then gave her mom a big hug and kiss and at 10.45 p.m., the little girl ran off with her two gal pals. The three kids pranced over to a sandy hill near the parking lot, which Colleen could kind of see, so she relaxed a little, knowing she could glance over every once in a while just to make sure everything was okay with Morgan. Once the game was over, Colleen left the stands and headed for the parking lot, which is where she planned to grab Morgan so they could head home for the night. As she walked that direction, she saw Morgan's two friends 
but Morgan wasn't with them. Colleen stopped the two girls to ask them where her daughter was, and they told her that Morgan was already at the car getting the sand out of her shoes. Colleen raced over to her car and started searching around. After looking in, around, and under the vehicle, fear started to creep in. Morgan was gone. A few minutes passed, and at that point, just about everyone had cleared out of the stadium and parking lot. And still, no Morgan. Colleen knew her daughter was too shy and timid to just run off, so she assumed the worst. Morgan had been abducted. At that point, Colleen called the police to report her daughter missing, and officers raced over to the field. Since Morgan was last seen with Ty and Jessica, those were the first people questioned by the police. They told officials that they were all just playing in the sand, catching fireflies. But then they mentioned seeing a strange man lurking around, and the officer's ears perked up. This man, who Ty and Jessica specifically described as creepy, apparently talked to the girls for a bit earlier in the evening. And then he just kind of hung around and watched them while they continued to play and none of them thought to tell one of their parents? This was in 1995, so the whole stranger danger thing had been around for quite some time. Well, as the little league game neared its end, the three girls decided to head back. Before going back to the stands, they dumped the sand out of their shoes and mentioned seeing the guy still standing there by his red pickup truck, just watching. It's not clear why Jessica and Ty split off from Morgan, but based on what they told Colleen, it seemed like Morgan was just gonna wait by the car for her mom to get there so they could ride home. After their interviews with Jessica and Ty, detectives knew they were dealing with something bad. They automatically assumed that the guy hanging out by the truck must have been the one who snatched up Morgan. The crazy thing about all of this is there was a guy who tried to abduct a little kid in the same city just a few hours earlier. And this was a pretty small town, so it wasn't like this kind of thing happened all the time. So in the earlier incident, a man who drove a red pickup truck came into a laundromat in Alma and tried to take a four-year-old little girl. Thankfully, the kid's mom was nearby and was able to stop the dude from stealing her kid, but he got away without anyone seeing him. When officers found out about Morgan's disappearance, they immediately had the idea that maybe the guy who tried to steal the kid at the laundromat was the same person who took Morgan. He could have been so set on the idea of taking a child that day that when he failed the first time, he just drove around town looking for another one to snatch up. That would be so messed up, but that theory actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, what are the odds that there are two villainous child robbers in one small Arkansas town? That night, the cops were unsuccessful in finding Morgan or coming across any solid leads. The following day, there was another attempted kid snatching where a nine-year-old girl was forced into the men's bathroom at a corner store in a town close by. This girl was able to escape, but the man who tried to steal her looked very similar to the guy described in Morgan's case. So it seems like there was a predatorial man on the lookout for kids in Arkansas, and it seems like he was pretty unsuccessful in most of his attempts to pick them up. Well, except for Morgan. So in the days following the tragic Little League game, authorities conducted a huge search for Morgan. Officers searched on foot and horseback, and they were joined by friends, family, and other concerned citizens who desperately wanted to help bring Morgan home. Now I'm gonna start assembling my hot dogs. An artist worked with Jessica and Ty to create a sketch of the suspicious man, and the flyers were posted everywhere. The man was believed to be somewhere between 23 and 38 years old. He was about six feet tall, weighed 180 pounds, and had dark hair with a mustache and short beard. The night of the ball game, he was wearing denim cutoff shorts, and his chest hair was visible enough for Jessica and Ty to remember it. The girls also said the guy had a hick accent, and he drove an old red pickup truck with one of those camper shells on top. Okay, is it just me, or are they looking for Larry the Cable Guy? So after this hillbilly's whole headshot and resume was plastered around town, detectives were hopeful they'd get a hit from it. And all the while, Colleen stayed in the Alma Volunteer Firehouse because she didn't feel right going back to Ozark without her daughter. She was also in the middle of separating from her husband, so I'm sure there was a bunch of drama back home for her to deal with. Oh my gosh, this poor woman! 
She was probably so distraught that her daughter was missing, and I can't imagine how much guilt she put on herself for every little step that led her to the field that day. You know, like, what if I never let Morgan go play with Jessica and Ty? What if I never even agreed to go to the game in the first place? And all of the other terrible what ifs. And not only is Colleen having to deal with a terrible mixture of guilt, loss, frustration, and pain, but now she's adding in a little husband drama and the sadness of being away from her two other little kids. Welcome aboard the emotional roller coaster. Please keep all hands, feet, and other objects inside the cart at all times. And don't forget to buckle up. Due to the nature of Colleen's relationship, investigators did look into her and her husband as potential suspects, but they determined the two were very civilized. Since there weren't any dramatic custody battles or spurts of domestic violence, Colleen and her husband were quickly ruled out as suspects. So now it was time to really lean into the guy in the sketch. After the drawing and description of the suspect had been posted at every building around town, people started making connections and calling the cops with tips. It started with people from Alma claiming to have seen the perp or his truck. But over time, people from Texas and Oklahoma started sending in tips about the man in the sketch. And I can't tell if these people genuinely believe that they saw this guy or were just messing with the cops. But based on the fact that this was a case about a missing little girl, I really hope that people didn't try and get in the way of the investigation. Well, authorities looked into each and every report that was made, but they all turned out to be dead ends. In the first week alone, there were 247 people who were reported seeing a red pickup truck. 247, that's insane. But then again, this was in Arkansas, so that's most people's vehicle of choice out there. But one day, the phone rang at the police station, and it actually turned out to be a hot new lead. So about two weeks after Morgan's disappearance, there was a man named Albert from an Arkansas town about three hours away, who thought he saw Morgan and her abductor. While he was out doing yard work, he noticed some guy approach his truck and try to break in. As soon as the mysterious guy saw Albert, he ran off into the woods, but he didn't run off alone. There was a young little blonde girl with him. Albert was certain the duo he saw was Morgan and the mysterious perp from the sketch. So he called the police to report the sighting. And once the detectives were informed, they knew it was go time. So now I'm gonna repeat those steps with my other dogs. And here's the part of the story where super intense action music starts playing in my head. Anyone else? In the snap of a finger, they sent a bunch of officers to the location of the sighting, which was about 200-ish miles away in the town of Stuttgart, Arkansas. The authorities were so hopeful about their new lead that they loaded up Morgan's parents in a private jet and took them out with them. Once everyone arrived on site, detectives sectioned off a six square mile area that surrounded the specific spot where Albert saw Morgan and the mystery truck driver. They scoured the area with infrared lights, search dogs, and officers on horseback. But after 16 gruesome hours of searching in hot, humid, mosquito-ridden conditions, the search was called off. The detectives must have been so bummed out. And like, what do you do after that? How do you go about the rest of your week knowing you were so close to finding Morgan and failing? In a way, it's kind of like that feeling you get as a kid when you lose a sports game or something. It's so sad and frustrating. And then after you try to drink a Capri Sun, but you're still so bent up about the loss that the Pacific Cooler flavor just doesn't hit the same. It's like that, but about 152 times worse. Anyway, after the unsuccessful search, detectives brought Albert in for questioning and sent him up to a polygraph test, which he failed twice. Once Albert knew he was caught, he finally told the truth. He said there was a man trying to break into his truck that day, but he admitted that there wasn't a little girl with him at all. And he didn't really know if the bad guy looked like the perp in the sketch. And you bet your bottom dollar that those investigators were fuming. They just sent out all their best search teams, flew out the missing girl's family, and got attacked by a swarm of mosquitoes, all for an attempted break-in on one man's truck. If I were an investigator, that'd be the day I got fired, because I'd definitely jump across the table and show Albert a piece of my mind. After wasting thousands of dollars on a pointless search, 
Albert was arrested for filing a false police report. Colleen and her estranged husband flew back home Morganless, and the detectives were back to square one. They revisited their old leads and investigated the people who were at the game that night. And even though Little League makes it sound like the crowd was pretty small, there turned out to be around 300 people there that night, so it wasn't an easy feat to check their names off the suspect list. Basically, everything about this case just started turning cold, and as more days passed, the more authorities feared Morgan was gone for good. In 2002, seven years after the incident, police got a tip that led them to search through a chunk of land about an hour away from Alma. It isn't clear what the tip was, and I would normally believe it had to be legit enough for officials to follow through with it, but we're talking about the same people that flew a mourning family across the state for a faulty lead. This time, authorities didn't bring out the whole fam, but they did send out a team of search dogs and dug up parts of the property. Nothing new really came from that search, and again, the case fell flat. Eight years later, someone called the cops to tell them about a vacant home near Alma, where a child-targeting convict used to live. Even though the guy who was ratted out to the police didn't really look like the perp from the sketch, detectives were so desperate to solve Morgan's case that they went out to look for any evidence of the girl. Seven years later, they went back to that house to do a more thorough search, but they still came up empty-handed. I am getting a headache by all of the back and forth. I get that these investigators really wanted to solve the case, but was it necessary for them to go back to that house seven years later when they just could have searched it right the first time? Morgan's parents probably kept getting their hopes up too. As of now, the case of Morgan Nick's disappearance remains wide open. Most recently, an actual photo of the perp's truck was released, and a documentary came out about Morgan's story. The family is hopeful that as new leads come in, one of them will turn out to be productive. Colleen is determined to find her daughter, and she's even created an organization to assist other families dealing with missing children. And as much as other people hope Morgan is still alive, there is a group of FBI profilers who believe Morgan's abductor was a skilled professional. Wonderful. Well, sorry to leave you on such a negative note, but when talking about cases that deal with missing children who haven't been found, it's not like they're ever positive. I'd like to think that Morgan is still out there, and based on the way detectives keep hustling to find her, we may get our happy ending after all. Until then, we'll have to create our own happy ending with other things, like food. Chicago dogs, anyone? Hello all of you beautiful people, thank you for joining us on today's episode of Killer Bites, the show where we talk about the craziest true crime stories out there. If there's a particular story you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments. Today we're covering the case of Mark Winger, the man who almost got away with using a hammer to end his wife's life. But you guys, he had a really good reason. He wanted to run away with another woman and framed it on somebody else. The things people do for love cannot be me. Let's get into it, shall we? Mark Winger was born on November 26, 1962 in the sweet little Midwestern town of Springfield, Illinois. He grew up in a tight-knit Jewish family and they really valued the time they spent together. This stayed with Mark into his adulthood and he grew up always wanting a family of his own one day. So that's when Mark's brother set him up on a blind date with Donna Brown. Everyone who knew Donna loved her and said she was the most genuine, fun, and loyal person. And you know how some people were just born to be moms? She was one of those people. Donna is what I like to refer to as the cool mom friend, who you always go to for advice and a good ass time. Well, when Donna and Mark met, they pretty much clicked like that. Donna loved that Mark was funny and smart, and once they started officially dating, he was the most attentive person. He always made Donna the priority, and everyone just loved the two of them together. And wouldn't you know it, on March 4th of 1988, Mark and Donna got married. 
After they tied the knot in Florida, Mark got a job as a nuclear engineer in Springfield, Illinois. So they headed to the Midwest to start this new chapter of life together. Unfortunately, the couple was unable to conceive a child after trying for a while. She was at her doctor's office when her doctor brought up a young patient who was pregnant, but they couldn't take care of the baby. They were looking for a great couple who were ready to be parents. Well, Donna was in the right place at the right time, and on May 27, 1995, Bailey Elizabeth Winger was brought into the family. Donna's best friend, Deanne Schultz, worked with her at the hospital and loved watching Bailey. A few months passed and Donna took a trip to visit her parents in Florida. She brought along Bailey and they had a great time. But the trip back to Springfield was an uncomfortable experience for Donna. From Florida, they flew into St. Louis and took a 90-minute airport shuttle ride back home. But the driver of the shuttle was genuinely freaking Donna out. He talked to her about really inappropriate stuff and was swerving and speeding like a bat out of hell. Donna and her three-month-old were so scared that she worried they wouldn't even make it home. She told Mark what happened and he was pissed, obviously. He told Donna to write down everything that happened between her and this man so they could have a physical document. Afterwards, he rang up the manager of the shuttle transportation company and demanded to know who the hell this man was and why he hadn't been fired yet. The company manager said the driver's name was Roger Harrington and he was promptly removed from their team. Less than a week after this weird drive home from the airport, Mark called 911, horrified and hyperventilating. Donna had been brutally attacked in the living room. The choice of weapon? A hammer. Next to her lay a man with two bullets in his head. They were both hanging on to life at this point because their wounds were just so severe. Here's what happened. Mark was downstairs working out on the treadmill when he heard a really loud thud from upstairs. He ran upstairs to check it out and that's when he heard Bailey crying from the master bedroom, but Donna wasn't with her. She was just lying on the bed alone. Mark walked down the hallway and saw a man using a hammer to attack Donna over and over again. It was just so brutal. Mark grabbed his firearm and fired it twice in self-defense. Sadly, both Roger and Donna passed away. She was 31 years old. When Detective Cox checked the man's wallet on the ground, his ID said Roger Harrington, 27 years old. And in that moment, Detective Cox started to piece everything together. So as a bit of a side gig, Detective Cox owned a trailer park in which Roger Harrington was a tenant. He knew that Roger had a history of domestic disputes, so something like this wasn't entirely out of the ballpark. But get this, friends and officers were outside checking Roger's vehicle when they discovered a note in the front seat. It said, Mark Winger, 23 Westview Drive, 4.30 p.m. Detectives asked if Mark had any idea who the guy he fired at was. He asked, is his name Roger? And the police were like, OMG, yeah, what the hell? To which Mark replied, that's the man who's been stalking us all week. Mark goes on to tell them the story of Donna's horrible shuttle from the airport experience and how Roger kept calling their home over and over again with the stalking and the harassment. Obviously, Roger was suspended from his job because of this. When you mess with people's money, it's almost inevitable that things will get ugly. Mark gets Roger fired. Roger now had a motive to attack. Detectives found pages of the notebook where Donna documented this story and her own handwriting up on the fridge. Roger ticked a lot of boxes and the court ruled that Mark acted in self-defense. So now this seemed like a done deal case and it was time to mourn this terrible, inconceivable loss. Donna's family flew out to Springfield to be with Mark after Donna's passing. They all wanted to be together and they wanted to support Mark through this traumatic experience. And for the next few months, members of the family would fly out and help him take care of his newborn baby. The family made sure to be in each other's lives because it felt like so much bad stuff was packed on top of the other that if they didn't support each other through it, they would fall apart. But after a while, the family couldn't keep up the constant traveling back and forth, so they decided Mark should hire some help. Being a single parent is difficult, especially after an event like that, so Mark took their suggestions and hired Rebecca Schultz. Rebecca was a super pretty young woman who instantly clicked with the family. After losing two moms at such a young age, Rebecca felt like she could really help this family and form a special bond and a special bond would indeed be created. After a few months, life started to slowly move forward a little bit. Rebecca was there, and now the healing was really up and going. Shortly after, Rebecca and Mark were pregnant and having a child together. Can you believe that? Just a few months after your wife passed away and you took the life of a man in your living room? Seems a little quick to me, Mark, sweetie. And I gotta say, I don't know how I'd react in a situation like that. If I was Donna's family, I'd be really taken aback, but I guess you want him to be happy and move on, right? And they were for the most part. But Deanne, y'all remember Deanne? She didn't like Rebecca and the whole situation with Mark. Mark was also getting around $150,000 in life insurance and thousands of dollars from the Crime Victims Compensation Fund. It's a fund that gives financial help to victims' families for funeral expenses, loss of income, and things like that. Shortly after the pregnancy, Mark proposed to Rebecca after converting to another faith to be with her. This shocked his rabbi and the whole family, honestly. Religion was super important to Mark and their entire family, so to just up and convert once you get your nanny pregnant was a significant shift for Mark's family. 
But in October 1996, Mark and Rebecca eloped in Maui. It was a super tiny, closed service, and they had a celebration dinner once they returned. But the family felt like this was all moving so freaking fast. And over time, Mark pushed out Donna's family completely, even going so far as to say Bailey couldn't call Donna's mother grandma anymore. She begged Mark to let her be a part of her grandchild's life, but he flat out refused. He doesn't want to think about Donna anymore, which, listen, I can understand somebody wanting to move on with their life, sure. But to totally cut off your late wife's family is just out of this world weird to me. So the couple would parent four children together, two of which were adopted, including Bailey. At that point, Donna's family backed off and let Mark live his new life. All the while, Roger Harrington's family was still fighting for justice. They just couldn't fathom that Roger committed this crime. Sure, he had a history of mental illness and outbursts. Still, he never seemed capable of committing an act so horrific. Luckily for them, some of the detectives working on the case didn't fully believe that Roger Harrington was to blame either. For starters, there were no signs of forced entry, meaning someone must have let him in. Why the hell would Donna let Roger in, a man she's genuinely scared of leaving her baby on the bed? Furthermore, why the heck was there a note with Mark's name, address, and time written on it? Seems like Roger went to Mark's house as an invited guest. He said he never invited Roger over, and that looked like the end of that. Everything seemed to be coming to a complete close until Mark and his happy little butt couldn't stop making trips to the police station. Specifically, he showed up at the station asking for his weapon back. He would come to the station every so often to update the cops on his personal life. And then, get this y'all, Deanne, you remember Deanne, right? Well, Deanne came to the police in 1998 because she had been hiding a juicy freaking secret and it was eating her alive. She admitted that she and Mark were having an affair that began a month before Donna's murder and continued a little bit after she had passed. Deanne claimed that Mark had wanted out of his marriage for a while. He had even mentioned that things would be so much easier if Donna just wasn't living anymore. And then, this dude had the absolute audacity to ask her if she wanted to get in on the murder plot. Obviously, this is Donna's best friend. Yeah, she's sleeping with her husband, but she didn't actually want to physically hurt her. Well, once she came out with this information, the investigators started connecting the dots. This wasn't Roger's doing. This was planned and executed by Mark Winger himself. It made sense to investigators. Mark had been unhappy in his marriage and wanted a way out of it for a hot minute. Once the crazy story with Roger came up, Mark took it as the perfect opportunity to take out Donna once and for all. So even after giving Deanna a ring, he went on and married Rebecca anyway and had kids with her. So now the police have this in the bag. They could prove the affair, they had the note from Roger's vehicle, and they found some new pieces of evidence. Polaroids from the crime scene before the bodies were moved by paramedics were found, and these pictures weren't found or used for the first trial. The positioning of the bodies didn't match up with Mark's story in the slightest. On top of all this, Roger didn't even bring a weapon to the house. This guy had a freaking blade and a tire iron in his car and he didn't use either? Suspicious. Well, the jury found all this very interesting and after 13 hours of deliberation, Mark Winger was found guilty. On August 9th of 2002, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After all these years of Mark living everyday life, he was finally put away. Can you imagine being in this family? First, you feel so bad for your son-in-law because what a terrible thing to go through, right? And then you find out that he's the one who did it and framed an innocent man after he killed him? As for Rebecca, she filed for divorce, duh, and now takes care of Bailey along with her other children. And that, my friends, is the wild story of Mark Winger and how he almost got away with murder. Can you believe it? It just goes to show what is done in the dark almost always comes to light. Thanks for watching, everyone. My name is Allie, and I'll see you next crime. How many women did Jeffrey Willis murder? And who is the woman who brought him to justice? Hi, I'm Brandy, and welcome back to another chilling episode of the true crime show, Killer Bites. Let's get into it. Jeffrey Willis grew up in Average Joe. In high school, he had plenty of friends. He was pretty popular and he ran track. He grew up, graduated, went out into the world and got a job. And he seemed like a regular good guy. He got married and became a loving husband. He would take his grandfather out to breakfast every Sunday morning and he volunteered to ring the bell for the Salvation Army during the holiday season. But something was off. Something much darker was lurking below the surface. There was a dark side of Jeffrey. And if you took a closer look at Jeffrey Willis, you'd see a bunch of bright red flags. For example, Jeffrey had been known to make multiple inappropriate sexual comments about the female bodies and genitalia toward women and young girls. Back in high school, it was reported that he heavily assaulted one of his classmates. 
the classmate was not a fan of Jeffrey's advances and asked him a few hundred times to stop what he was doing, leave her alone, and drive her home. Eventually, he stopped, changed his attitude, and agreed to drive the girl back to her home. Fast forward to 1995, Jeffrey was fired from his job as a custodian at an elementary school. Why was he fired? He was using one of the computers meant for the young students. He was using it to view violent porn. And I'd like to take this moment to say it is highly inappropriate to watch porn while at work, and even more inappropriate to watch porn at an elementary school. It seems like a no-brainer to me. But it makes it 10 times worse that he was watching violent and disturbing pornography. Then moving on to 2007, Jeffrey was accused of stalking a young woman in a retail store. He followed her around the store as she shopped. He followed her into the parking lot after the store, and all the while videotaping her without her consent. The woman went to the police about the incident and filed a police report, but it was never prosecuted. And the examples I just gave barely scratch the surface of what is to come of Jeffrey Willis. August 16th, 2016, a 16-year-old Madison Nygaard was attempting to walk home after attending a party the night before. Unfortunately, she got lost on her way home. And to make matters even worse, she was in the middle of nowhere Michigan. The houses were few and far in between. Not an easy place to stop and ask for directions. As she was walking down the road around five in the morning, a man in a silver van pulled over to the side of the road and asked Madison if she needed help. And at first she was pretty relieved when the van pulled over since she had been wandering around aimlessly for hours. She really did need some help. The man rolled down the window and asked if she was okay and if she needed help. She asked if she could use his cell phone to call her mom since the battery was dead on her personal cell phone. He said sure, she could use his cell phone, but she would have to get in the car if she wanted to use it. She agreed, thanked him, and then climbed into the van. Once she was inside, he locked the doors from the inside and rolled up the window. Madison asked him if he would roll the window back down because she was feeling a little uncomfortable. He agreed and rolled the window back down as they started to drive down the road. She asked him again for the cell phone to call her mom and he said no because his cell phone was dead. Strange. The whole reason she got in the car in the first place was because he said she could use his phone. She knew something was wrong. Just then, the man reached below his seat and whipped out a firearm and pointed it at Madison. She begged and pleaded with him to stop the car so she could get out, but he refused. He kept driving down the road and kept pointing the weapon at Madison's head. She felt she had no option but to jump out of the van as it was speeding down the road. She took a nasty fall, getting road rash all over her body. However, with all that adrenaline pumping, Madison still managed to get up. She started screaming and running towards the closest house to try and find some help. The man stopped the car, put it in park, and got out to try and find Madison. He pointed the gun at her and watched as she ran away from him. All the while, she was screaming at the top of her lungs at him to please not shoot. Madison was running for her life and was almost to the house when the homeowner opened the door and stepped outside to see what all the commotion was about. The homeowner was having her morning cup of coffee when she heard the cries of a young woman screaming for help. Upon seeing the homeowner coming out to help Madison, the driver of the van got back into his car and sped away. Madison made it to the house. She quickly ran inside and into a back guest bedroom. She crawled under the bed for safety. She was terrified. She didn't know whose house she was hiding in, but she figured it had to be safer than being out there with that man. From under the bed, she begged for the woman to call the police and to call her mother. The woman dialed 911 and then handed the phone over to Madison who explained what she just went through. Soon after, Madison was rushed to the hospital and treated for her injuries from jumping out of the car. Remember that road rash? Yeah, she definitely needed some tending to. The police started their investigation right away. Madison recalled that the vehicle that she had gotten into was a silver minivan, but she could not remember the details. She couldn't remember the make or the model of the car. They uncovered footage from a local security camera close to the crime scene that confirmed the vehicle was a silver Chrysler town and country minivan. 
With this helpful information, the police were able to narrow down the suspects to 31 possible owners of this type of car in this particular area of Michigan. The police brought a lineup of driver's license photos of people who had registered for the specific type of silver minivan. Madison was quick to pick out who had kidnapped her. She picked out a man named Jeffrey Willis. The next step was for the police to obtain a search warrant for Jeffrey Willis's home and van to hopefully find evidence that could further prove Jeffrey was guilty of committing this crime. Jeffrey actually had two homes that they needed a search warrant for. One that he shared with his wife. The other was a cabin he had inherited from his grandfather after he had passed away. The police went in and searched the computer in his home where they discovered Jeffrey's darker interests in violent pornography, including abductions and rape. His specific interest in necrophilia. Jeffrey had a huge collection, hours upon hours of offensive and violent porn. The videos were mostly shot up close of the girl's butt and genital area. Also in their search, the investigators found that Jeffrey kept a list of serial killers. It was an extensive list, which included the names of his favorite serial killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, AKA the Toolbox Killers. The Toolbox Killers murdered five teenage girls in a five month span and kept their rape kit hidden in a toolbox, and they were known for recording some of their torture and murder sessions for their own amusement. Perhaps Jeffrey was studying up on some of his favorite murders or admiring their work? Perhaps he was aspiring to be just like the toolbox killers. Through the search of the properties and van, the police also uncovered a rape kit. It included handcuffs, extreme-sized sex toys, torture devices, syringes, and insulin that he had taken from his diabetic wife. Jeffrey would attempt to inject his victims with the insulin because someone who's not diabetic would go into shock, and it would be easier for him to control them, manipulate them, and tie them up if they were pumped full of insulin. The investigators found a lockbox with two types of ammunition found inside. One type of ammunition found inside the lockbox was a match to that of the crime scene. The other type matched the bullet cartridge found at the scene of another crime that took place not too far away. The bullet was a match for the death of Rebecca Blush. Rebecca was a young woman whose life was unfortunately taken back in 2014 when she was out jogging. A single bullet cartridge wouldn't be enough evidence alone to connect Jeffrey to Rebecca's murder. But luckily, the police found more incriminating evidence to tie him to her death and a third victim, Jessica Hiringa. The police investigators also found a hard drive hidden behind one of the walls of his home. On the hard drive, there was a folder labeled VIX, which I'm assuming is short for victims. Within the VIX folder, there were two other folders. One was labeled RB, the initials of Rebecca Bletch. In this folder were a bunch of photos and news articles about the death of Rebecca. The other folder was labeled JH, the initials of Jessica Hiringa. In that folder were pictures of the missing woman. So what exactly happened to Rebecca and Jessica? Back on June 29, 2014, Rebecca was on a nice jog about a mile from her home in Michigan when all of a sudden she was attacked. Hours later, a car driving by sees something lying in the road. One would naturally assume it to be an animal hit by a car. The driver brought their car to a stop and got out of the car to inspect the situation. However, as they got closer, they realized that it was not an animal lying in the middle of the road, but a person, Rebecca. The driver called 911 for help. The driver begged the 911 operator to hurry as she could still feel a faint pulse. The operator instructed the driver to attempt CPR on Rebecca to revive her, but it was too late. By the time help arrived, Rebecca was too far gone to make a recovery. Rebecca had three bullet wounds to the head, one wound in the back of her head and two wounds on the side of her head. On the side of the road, police found Rebecca's belongings, including her phone, sunglasses, and headphones. Her belongings were stacked in a neat pile. The police found a spent 22 caliber bullet cartridge near her personal belongings. Closer to Rebecca's body were an additional two unspent bullet cartridges laying on the ground. The police investigators speculated that at first Rebecca complied with her attacker's demands. He probably instructed her to place her things on the ground, and then as she was doing so, he got a hold of her, tried to restrain her, and force her into the van. 
Then either Jeffrey had his way with her and then dumped her out of the van onto the street and shot her. Or perhaps Rebecca tried to fight back and run away from her attacker. And while she was running, he fired a bullet into the back of her skull. And then she tried to go and collect her things on the side of the road when he fired two more times, thus ending her life. I don't know about you, but I like to think that Rebecca tried to escape and run away like Madison did. But as I said, this is all just speculation. Nobody knows exactly what went down that day, and nobody ever will. Not unless Jeffrey decides to come clean. Rebecca's DNA was later found in Jeffrey's van in his rape and torture kit, confirming that Jeffrey was the one responsible for Rebecca's death. The other folder found on Jeffrey Willis's hard drive was a folder marked JH for Jessica Hiringa. But what happened to Jessica? Well, back in 2013, on April 26th, Jessica, a 25-year-old single mother of a young boy, started her day by going out and collecting some groceries. Then later, she started her shift at a local gas station in Norton Shores, Michigan, when she suddenly disappeared. Earlier in the day, a friend stopped by the gas station to visit Jessica at work. They chatted for a while. While the friend was there, Jessica had to go out of the shop to one of the gas pumps to change the roll of paper in order to distribute receipts to customers. While she was out there, it was reported that a man in a bluish, silverish van pulled up next to her and the pump and struck up a casual conversation with her. It seemed to be a pleasant and brief conversation. Then the car drove away and Jessica returned back inside. But the man in the van she was talking to is believed to be Jeffrey Willis. 10.55 p.m. was Jessica's last reported sale of the day, and after that, she vanished. A few minutes later, around 11 p.m., the gas station manager and her husband were out for a ride on their motorcycle and just happened to drive by the gas station. The manager spotted a bluish, silverish van drive behind the Exxon gas station. The van made a U-turn and then came to a stop and turned its headlights off. The manager also noticed that the gas station rear security light was not coming on while the van was back there. She thought this was sketchy. She even thought it was possible that maybe Jessica was attempting to steal from the store. So she and her husband turned around on their motorcycle and parked next door at the mall, which had a good view of the back of the Exxon gas station. That's where they saw someone standing at the back of the van with the hatch open. That someone was Jeffrey Willis. It looked like Jeffrey was doing something or tending to something in the back of the van and then quickly shut the hatch, climbed into the driver's seat and drove off. The manager and her husband then followed the van down the road for a while, but the van didn't do anything else out of the ordinary. So after a while, they stopped following it. Little did they know that was the moment that Jeffrey was pulling Jessica into his van. About 15 minutes later, a customer pulled up to the gas station, but the pump wasn't working. So they went inside the store to talk to an employee for some help. Inside the store was another customer looking for an employee, but couldn't seem to find one. They realized something was wrong and called 911. The police arrived shortly thereafter and searched the store, but couldn't find anyone. However, they did find Jessica's personal belongings were still in the back office. Jessica had left her purse and jacket. Officers determined that there didn't seem to be a struggle inside the store, but outside of the store, they happened upon a large splatter of blood at the back door. They also found what appeared to be a battery cover from a gun sight and batteries. This investigation was pretty extensive. It included 50 federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and 14 specialized units in aviation, behavioral sciences, technical services, and intelligence analysis from 15 local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. Over the next three and a half years, there were 1,400 tips received, 33 search warrants executed, 20 residential searches by consent, plus two underwater searches and 12 ground searches. At one point, there were up to 75 different investigators on this specific case. And Jessica's friends, families, and peers were also out on the hunt for Jessica. They banded together and had multiple search parties to hopefully bring her home. Everyone was searching high and low for Jessica, but she was nowhere to be found. Still to this day, her remains have not been found. But in the present day, we do know who was responsible for her disappearance and death. The responsible party is Jeffrey Willis. After attacking her at the gas station, Jeffrey drove Jessica back to his grandfather's cabin and ended her life. Jessica, Rebecca, and Madison all had something in common. 
they all crossed paths with Jeffrey Willis. Two of these encounters were fatal, but thanks to Madison escaping her abduction, she was able to bring Jeffrey Willis to justice. On May 25th, 2016, Jeffrey was charged with the murder of 36-year-old Rebecca Sue Blesch. The trial took place and Jeffrey insisted that he had nothing to do with Rebecca's death. And surprisingly enough, his defense team actually came out and tried to blame the whole thing on his cousin, Kevin Blum. He said that Blum was the one who actually knew Rebecca and he was obsessed with her. The defense said, quote, we believe Kevin Blum is your murderer. Blum stalked her on Facebook, had her photos on his phone. Blum knew where Willis's gun was. Blum obsessed about Mrs. Blush. But there was not enough evidence to support that Blum was at fault for the crime. Rhonda Blum, Kevin's wife, took the stand at the trial and confirmed that Blum was at a soccer tournament the day Blutch was killed, so he could not have been involved in her death. The defense argued that his alibi and Rhonda's timeline didn't add up, but it was a poor argument, and at this point, they were just trying to throw things at the wall and hoping something sticks. Meanwhile, there was plenty of evidence that pointed to Jeffrey being the culprit. The prosecutors brought in the evidence of the VIX folder with Rebecca's initials inside, as well as a slew of pictures and articles about what happened to Rebecca on his hard drive. The shell casings found at the scene matching the shells in Jeffrey's possession, and the DNA evidence. Michigan State Police forensic scientist Michelle Schmidt went on the stand and confirmed that Rebecca's DNA was on a pair of gloves and there was strong support. It also was found on one of the sexual devices in the toolbox. And Jeffrey's DNA was also found on the same pair of gloves, as well as on the barrel and grip of the gun identified as the murder weapon by ballistics experts. The evidence was stacked against him. And on top of that, his now ex-wife went on the stand to testify at the trial, where she said that Jeffrey had written her from jail while he was awaiting his trial. She said he was trying to plant memories about the day Blesh was killed more than two years earlier. He was trying to convince his ex-wife that they were together that day, so he couldn't have done the crime. She said he wrote about the events of the day that Blesh died, even reminding her what shirt he wore. On November 2nd, 2017, Jeffrey Willis was found guilty of first degree murder in the death of Rebecca Blesh and of the use of a firearm in the commission of a felony. Jeffrey blew kisses to the courtroom as he was escorted out after the trial concluded. After the trial, Rebecca's sister was extremely emotional, as to be expected from a family member who just lost a loved one. Rebecca's sister spoke after the trial about Jeffrey's little kissing incident, saying, so the fact that Jeffrey Willis just walked out of the courtroom and wouldn't hear any of us, it just goes to show what a coward he is. And then he turns around and blows a kiss, that's his kiss of death. I don't think he's gonna make it very long in prison. I hope he gets what he deserves. Six weeks after the trial, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During the trial, Jeffrey requested to leave the courtroom and not hear the statements from the Blush family. Judge William Marietti approved this request. This little stunt sparked a lot of drama. Shouldn't he have to sit there and listen to the Blush family grieve and give their statements? I think he should have to sit there and witness it all. And the state of Michigan thought so too, because on March 9th, 2018, the Michigan House of Representatives passed a bill that will require convicted defendants to listen to victims' impact statements at sentencing. On May 10th, 2018, it was passed by the Michigan Senate. Then Michigan Governor Rick Snyder signed it, making it a law on May 24th, 2018. It is officially called Rebecca Blush Law. In May of 2018, Jeffrey Willis finally stood trial for the death of Jessica Hearinga. He claimed he had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance or death. The trial dragged on for six long days. The jury had two separate 11 hour deliberations before finally reaching their final verdict. Jeffrey was guilty of first degree premeditated and felony murder and the sexually motivated kidnapping of Jessica Hearinga. Jessica's case was all over the news for years and it had a huge impact on the community. A Michigan House of Representatives bill was officially announced titled the Jessica Hearinga Act or alternatively called Jessica's Law on December 9th, 2013. This bill would require convenience stores and gas stations that operate between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. to install and maintain a security camera system. Or alternatively, they would have at least two employees on shift during these hours. 
Gas stations and convenience stores that don't comply with the law would be charged up to $200 for each violation. As of right now, the bill has not been passed, so the law is not currently in effect. Small business owners are concerned about the cost associated with installing surveillance cameras or the hiring of additional staff. But I personally feel like this bill should go through to protect employees and keep them as safe as possible. Security cameras could also come in handy if there was ever a robbery or something like that. And I think you'd be happy to know that even though this isn't officially a law just yet, the gas station that Jessica worked at did install security cameras after Jessica's tragic death. So we know that Jeffrey Willis is the one responsible for the death of both Rebecca and Jessica. We also know he's the one who attempted to abduct the young Madison Nygaard. But it doesn't stop there. Jeffrey is also a suspect in the unsolved murder of a 15-year-old girl that occurred in 1996. The partially clothed body of 15-year-old Angela Thornburg was found on October 17, 1996. She was found by a hunter out in the woods in Fruitport Township, southwest of Muskegon. The case was ruled a probable homicide, but no one was ever arrested in the case. But it is likely the work of Jeffrey Willis. Unfortunately, there's just not enough evidence at this time to support the theory. I have a sneaking suspicion that Jeffrey Willis is probably behind this one too. But for now, Jeffrey is currently serving his time at the Maximum Security Cotton Correctional Facility in Jackson County, Michigan. Jeffrey Willis is a monster. I can't believe Jeffrey got away with it for so long, but I'm glad he's put behind bars. Better late than ever. And what Madison did was so brave. Not many people are able to escape from their abductor and live to tell the tale. And without her, the police might still be out there looking for Rebecca and Jessica's killer. We know he was the one behind Rebecca and Jessica's disappearance and murder. And he was responsible for the abduction of Madison. But do you think he could have also been the one to end the life of 15-year-old Angela Thornburg in 1996? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I'm Brandy. Thanks for watching another episode of Killer Bites. In a shocking battle of strength, 23-year-old Theo Decouchon was stabbed by 18-year-old Camille Angano at her home on November 30, 2021. After stabbing Theo, she strangled him with the cord of her dress. But how was it that someone so young could have performed an act so violent? And why? In early November, Camille Angano and Theo Decouchon from Franche-Comte met on social media. At this point, Theo is just 23 years old, has a job as a building painter, and lives with his parents. In Theo's eyes, Camille was young, free, and wildly independent, and this fascinated him. As the pair continue to interact, she seems to have an effect on him, spreading this sense of carefree sociability. Desperate to take their friendship further, Theo and Camille decided to meet at a nightclub the following weekend. But what was supposed to be a night of fun turned into something far more sinister and unplanned. While at the club together, Theo struck up a conversation with another girl, and she kissed him. Unfortunately for Theo, Camille saw the whole thing. Enraged, Camille blocks him on social media, but this only hooks Theo in further, and eventually, after Camille decides to reach out again, he's overjoyed. He apologizes profusely, telling her it was a mistake and that he had a crush on her. Camille seemed open to repairing the relationship and asked him if he wanted to make amends, inviting him to come to her home in Oisele that very evening. Camille lived in a small ground studio apartment, and Theo left home on November 29th with a spring in his step as he anticipated seeing her. That evening, he was also exchanging texts with two of his friends, Cecile and Pauline, but it would be the last time he would communicate with anyone. The next morning, Cecile tried to reach Theo, but had no success. She calls again and again, but all she gets is Theo's voicemail. Theo also hadn't shown up for work that day, and his car could not be located. Worried about her friend, Cecile decided to contact Camille, who reported that the evening had gone well and that she and Theo had been intimate and shared a pizza. David and Maureen, other acquaintances of both Camille and Theo, decided to get in touch with her to get to the bottom of the story. 
David had known Camille for some time, having participated in horse riding with her. Knowing that something has gone wrong that night, he puts pressure on her to tell him what happened, having the presence of mind to record the conversation. The idea that Theo has committed suicide floats around, but Camille declares that he came over and left and that she had nothing to do with it. Camille's reaction was overly erratic and defensive, yet also detached. David was surprised by this, and her odd behavior fueled his suspicions even further. So, he decided to go to Camille's studio apartment, but she was nowhere to be found. A note had been left on the door stating that she would be back in 15 days. On Wednesday of that week, Theo's mother went to the police to report her son as a missing person. Upon investigating, it was found that Theo's phone hadn't been active since 6.05 p.m. on November 30th. But his credit card had been and a withdrawal had been made from a gas station on that same date. In the following days, the credit card was used several more times. Investigators discovered the most recent withdrawal was for 600 euros from a cash machine. They decided to exploit the system's surveillance footage and collect a snapshot, which they then presented to David. He immediately recognized Camille's face. Just a few hours later, at Camille's home, Theo's body was discovered, wrapped in plastic, with his hands tied around his back. Camille was taken into custody and quickly admitted that she stabbed Theo in the stomach before strangling him with the cord of her dress. So just why did Camille kill what was seemingly an innocent man? According to Camille, Theo tried to sexually assault her. She alleged that they fell asleep in the same bed, fully dressed, and that she woke up at around four in the morning to feel him touching her. Camille claimed that she pushed him away and repeatedly said no, but he refused to listen. To those who knew Theo, the story was unbelievable. The man they'd known would never have non-consensually tried to touch a woman, let alone harm her. Theo was renowned for his shy personality and maintained a low profile around everyone he encountered. Theo's parents hired lawyer Christoph Bernard, who when examining the evidence, described the scene of Theo's murder as an execution of sorts, not retaliation in the face of sexual assault. Bernard reported that after he was stabbed, Theo was kneeling in front of the window and was fully incapacitated. But Camille decided she hadn't gone far enough and needed to end his life. Camille left her shoe marks on Theo's back, indicating that she used calculated force from behind. The addition of shoes meant she would have more grip and could force Theo down onto the ground, methodically strangling him with the cord. The question remained. Did Camille kill Theo to prevent a sexual assault, or was there another unscrupulous motive? A few factors clued investigators into Camille's state of mind on the day of the murder. On that day, she was allegedly trying to borrow a car. Her friend refused, and it was after this refusal that Camille decided to get back in touch with Theo. Camille also confessed something interesting during her arrest. She described having pigeons, referring to men she used whenever she needed them. Could Theo have been the last on the list? After the murder, Camille showed an astonishing lack of care or remorse, and at 7 a.m., just three hours after killing Theo, she sent him a text to cover her tracks. It read, Thanks for last night. It was really good. Be careful on the road. An hour later, after hiding Theo's body, she fled the scene in Theo's car, heading towards Bordeaux, 700 kilometers away. There, she would meet up with a man named Philippe. She had met him a week before Theo's murder through social media. While on the run, she rented a love room with a private jacuzzi for the pair of them for approximately two nights. While many speculated that Camille had premeditated the murder, it was theorized by some that she was simply acting impulsively true to the nature of her carefree personality. She was, after all, only 18 years old. Camille was also adamant that she felt she had the right to have these pigeons, as she called them, and also had the right to have sex whenever she wanted. 
but it would be odd for a victim of sexual assault to travel to meet a stranger for sexual relations just a few hours after a traumatic incident. Which is why investigators believed Camille was lying about the attempted sexual assault. They also discovered that when Camille returned from Bordeaux, she stopped in Dijon, spending the night at her ex-boyfriend's home. While there, she requested that he change Theo's car plates. In a bizarre and calculated move, the next day, she posted the police search bulletin for the missing Theo on her Facebook page. Then, she offered to assist David and Maureen in finding him. Camille tried to convince David and Maureen that she was desperate to find Theo and claimed she was spending hours at night looking for him. But this was a lie. Camille remained in custody, where she spoke with her mother and received legal counseling. According to her counsel, Camille did begin displaying signs of regret and would cry when she thought about what she had done. Allegedly, she also had nightmares every night, replaying the scene over and over again in her mind. Camille faces up to 30 years in prison if convicted, but this sentence could be reduced if the court recognizes her as a victim of an attempted sexual assault. But so far, all signs point to an impulsive act of violence and an attempt to deceive those around her and cover up the crime. As the legal proceedings unfold, the case of Theo and Camille raises haunting questions about the darkness that can dwell within seemingly ordinary people and the chilling acts they can commit. The complex web of deceit, the shocking lack of remorse, and the questions surrounding Camille's motives paint a grim picture of the events that transpired on that fateful night. Regardless of the verdict, this chilling tale shows that sometimes the darkest motives can hide behind a seemingly innocent facade and that the truth may be far more disturbing than we can ever imagine. Welcome back to Killer Bites, the bite-sized true crime show that kills. I'm Lucy, your host for this week's horror. On today's episode, we'll explore the murder of 19-year-old Faith Hedgepeth, who was discovered bludgeoned to death in her University of North Carolina Chapel Hill off-campus apartment. Did you go to college? Was it everything you hoped it would be? Were the parties sick, the classes engrossing, the freedom intoxicating? Faith's untimely death during her sophomore year would sadly truncate her dream to be the first person in her family to graduate college. It would rock the Chapel Hill community where less than one murder a year is the average for this small UNC college town. Much mystery surrounds her death, like the garbled voicemail left by Faith the night of her murder, the abundance of DNA from the crime scene, but the almost decade-long absence of a publicly cited suspect, or the sparse handwritten note left near her body. Despite the overwhelming amount of evidence, the case took over nine years for authorities to arrest a suspect. This is one of the longest and most intensive investigations in the state's history. Still, skepticism abounds as to the true killer, the details and motives for this terrible slaying. Let's see what we can uncover. Faith Danielle Hedgepeth was born on September 26, 1992 in Warren County, North Carolina. She was a member of the native tribe Haliwasaponi and grew up on the reservation. Although members of this tribe reside around the world, most live in a tight-knit community in this area. She was the youngest of four, and her oldest sister was 18 years old when she was born, so she helped to raise Faith. Her parents, Ronald and Connie, divorced when she was just a year old, and although her father moved away and she was mainly raised by her mom and sister, they remained close. Her friends, Yuna Chivas and Patricia Locklear, said she was a very social person, instantly made connections with people on campus, and that she smiled all the time one defining feature of her character that would continue to inspire friends and family. Her father had gone to UNC, and although he dropped out, this inspired Faith to follow his footsteps. She was awarded the prestigious Gates Millennium Scholarship and wanted to be a doctor or a teacher. She worked at a local Red Robin while in school to help cover living and going out expenses. She was a dedicated student, and although the UNC party atmosphere was part of her social circle, she made sure to keep her grades up. She lived in an off-campus apartment with her good friend, Karina Rosario. Rosario had a boyfriend, Eric Takoy Jones, that often stayed with them for a time like another roommate. However, this relationship was volatile. Having experienced domestic violence from Jones, Rosario eventually ended the relationship. 
In July 2012, Jones tried to break into their apartment on multiple occasions, even after Rosario had changed the locks. Faith had taken an active part in Rosario's social life, being roommates and close friends, and she helped her get a restraining order against her former boyfriend. Jones reportedly resented Faith's influence over his former girlfriend, and at one point he threatened her during a phone conversation, saying he would kill her if he could not get back together with Rosario. On the fateful night of September 6, 2012, Faith attended a recruiting event for the Alpha Pi Omega sorority until the early evening. She then met her roommate at their campus's Davis Library to write a history paper and study. They stayed until around 11.30 p.m. When they got home to their apartment complex, Hawthorne at The View, they decided they didn't want their night to end early, so they decided to go to a local club in Chapel Hill called The Thrill. Security footage from the club shows them arriving around 12.40 a.m. The Thrill was popular for undergrads in Chapel Hill as it infamously admitted underage people. Not much is known about what exactly the girls got up to at the club, as the surveillance footage couldn't pick them out amongst the crowd. But at around 2 a.m., Rosario said she wasn't feeling well, probably from drinking too much, so they decided to head home after cameras clocked them walking out with a few guys. It's reported they got back to their apartment around 3 a.m. Faith sent a text to Brandon Edwards, a former boyfriend of Rosario's, around 3.40 a.m., saying, Can you come over here, please? She needs you more than you know. Please let her know you care. There were messages to him from Rosario as well, but he only responded to Faith, saying, Who is this? When they returned home, Rosario apparently wasn't done with her night and called another student, Jordan McCreary, who was a star soccer player at their school. At around 4.30 a.m., Rosario left the apartment as she was being picked up. She reported that she left the door unlocked and Faith apparently was asleep in her bed. She told police that they only had one key, and since Faith was asleep, she didn't want to wake her to find their shared key before leaving. The next morning, Rosario tried to get a hold of Faith to ask her for a ride back home. Since she wasn't hearing back, she tried another friend, Marisol Rangel, who conceded to the request. When Rosario and Rangel returned to Faith and Rosario's apartment that morning around 11 a.m., they noticed her car still outside and wondered why she hadn't been checking her phone. They found out quickly, for when they got upstairs, they found Faith in her room unconscious. Reports differ as to where her body was specifically, next to her bed, on her bed, or lying halfway off of it. But regardless, she was undressed from the waist down, with her shirt pulled over her head, and there was blood everywhere, which Rosario repeated on the 911 call. 911, where is your emergency? I just walked into my apartment and my friend just walked into me unconscious. How old is she? She's 19. Is she breathing? I don't think so. Okay, listen to me. There's blood everywhere. There's what? There's blood everywhere. And she was already dead. She had suffered severe head trauma, and once investigators were on the scene, deemed that she had appeared to have been raped. When Faith's autopsy report was released to the public in September of 2014, it noted cuts and bruises on her arms and legs. There was also blood under her fingernails. Additional evidence of blood tissue and semen were discovered on Faith's body, and a bloody tampon was found near her body. One of the baffling details to the crime scene is that there was a note. Scrawled in all caps onto a white paper bag from a local popular takeout spot called Time Out near Faith's body said, I'm not stupid, bitch jealous. Faith must have stopped at the timeout, which was on her way home from the club, grabbing a late night snack before returning to her apartment. Tom Gasparoli has dedicated much of his journalistic and investigation skills to this crime, starting the podcast Pursuit, to track any rabbit hole dealing with her murder. He noted in an episode that the girl's apartment had other forms of paper scattered around. So why did the note's author grab the takeout bag to write on? In Less Than a Suicide, finding a note like this is very rare. It also curiously had no blood on it and was placed right on her bed where she was discovered. It is also believed that the note was written with the killer's non-dominant hand, perhaps to throw off investigators. Police surmise that the killer must have stayed longer after bludgeoning Faith since the note was bloodless and the murderer could have washed his hands before writing it. One investigator mentioned that although the murder seems out of control, the writing of the note seemed much the opposite. There were also two empty alcohol bottles in the room one that is believed to be the murder weapon, a Bacardi peach red bottle covered in blood and prints. However, there was almost no alcohol found in Faith's bloodstream, a mere 0.02%. They found semen on her body, and between this and the fingerprints, investigators were sure this DNA profile was the marker of the killer. Unfortunately, especially in 2012, they had over 1,800 people to interview and to narrow down based on her social circle and the DNA evidence. A profiler on the case believed that the murderer was someone who Faith knew, based on the intimate way she was killed, and that there were no signs of forced entry into the apartment. Yes, the front door was left unlocked, but how would someone know that, and when to come in after Rosario's departure, unless maybe they were stalking the girls? Immediate suspicion surrounded Jones, Rosario's former boyfriend, given his and Faith's less-than-amicable history. 
The day the murder was announced, Jones was one of the first people on a local news program expressing his disbelief over the murder and saying Faith was, quote, the sweetest person. He lived nearby the apartment, and his social media posts in the days surrounding her murder were questionable as well. One said, quote, Dear Lord, forgive me all of my sins and those I may commit. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. He also tweeted and texted a friend hours before the murder asking for forgiveness for, quote, what I'm about to do. Although he was ruled out a suspect based on his DNA, police have stayed mum on further details about him and his possible involvement, and only have remarked that he is still a person of interest, implying that he may know more about the case, even if he isn't the actual killer. Although never charged with any crime, suspicions followed Rosario and her possible involvement as well. The 911 call Rosario made has drawn much suspicion and interest in the many years of the case's investigation. Faith's father, Ronald, along with many podcasts and documentaries, have suggested the strange nature of Rosario's 911 call. For starters, analysts say that Rosario never mentioning Faith's name throughout the entire eight-minute call and giving extraneous detail about things being out of place in the room are not akin to the usual frantic, panic, heightened calls of people finding a loved one in such a horrific state. Rosario also never mentioned the note in this call, another seemingly strange omission. There were no outbursts or attempts, at least while on the phone, to help her friend, and some have even suggested that her weepy tone throughout was not genuine. A neighbor mentioned seeing Rosario exiting the apartment after the call in a very serene, calm manner. She thought you would never know that Rosario had just discovered a dead body. Up until 2016, it had been reported that Rosario had cooperated with the police and had been questioned at least 10 times. She's repeatedly declined being in any interviews or giving public statements. Also in 2016, audio specialist Arlo West deciphered a pocket dial voicemail sent from Faith's phone the night of the murder and reported that he parsed some of the dialogue from the recording. It appears to be a three-way conversation, or perhaps a dispute, three minutes long, between what sounds to be Hedgepeth and a male and female, with music in the background. West says you can hear Faith crying for help, while the female says, I think she's dying, and the male says, do it anyhow, after a long discussion in which the female seems to get angrier. Other phrases such as, you're a liar and I'm pissed, I figured out that bullshit, are said to be distinguishable. The male and female in the recording, he says, use the names Eric and Rosie, which was one of Rosario's nicknames. Faith's father Ronald is convinced that what was recorded was of his daughter's death, and Wes agrees. However damning some have said this possible audio could be, police have ruled this out as particularly insightful since the timestamp is at 1.23 a.m. while they were still at the nightclub. West is convinced, though, that the timestamp is wrong, as the phone that the voicemail was sent to would sometimes place timestamps incorrectly. He also discounts the background noises as being music from a nightclub, since his analysis did not produce any sounds like percussion, a heavy bass, or synthesizers. Moreover, there are none of the background sounds, like glasses clinking and others talking, that one would associate with a nightclub. 2020 also took the audio to an FBI specialty lab to see if they could decipher the audio, and at the time, they could not. The last text sent from Faith's phone was sent to Ty McNeil, her on and off again boyfriend, timestamped at 3.52 a.m., about 30 minutes before Rosario left the apartment for the night. It said, I know you're probably sleeping, but I just want to let you know I love you. Not a day goes by that you don't cross my mind. I know it will be like this the rest of my life because of what we've been through together. Besides that, I still feel the same and I still love you the same. Sorry for being in my feelings, but hey, without feelings, we wouldn't have any life. Sometimes I feel like you are my life. Faith and McNeil met during freshman orientation. Friends of Faith's expressed that the relationship did not seem healthy. They told her that he was not good for her. McNeil called Connie Hedgepeth the day he found out about the murder, although he and Faith were not together at the time. He expressed that it was strange he had received a text from Faith that morning and thought maybe she didn't send it. This information was left out of the police's notes as relevant evidence. One more man in Faith's life to note was her high school sweetheart, Alex Demery, who apparently had proposed to her not long before her murder. It is still not known how or if she had responded, but police called Demery in for questioning multiple times and they also got DNA from him. He was not a match. Her friends mentioned how much he had loved Faith and had known her most of their lives. Private investigator Hunter Glass has been looking into the case on behalf of Faith's family for years. His angle is that the handwriting on the note is a possible lead to a suspect. It led him to Brendan Edwards, the supposed friend of Faith and Rosario's that they texted the night of the murder. DNA evidence had ruled Edwards out years ago, but he lived with a convicted felon whose handwriting, obtained from a rental agreement document, had many similarities to the death scene note. We are unaware if police investigated this further. Given the evidence and details of the crime, it was highly believed that the killer was someone Faith knew. But even after years of testing and interviews, the DNA was not a match for anyone. 
As summed up on 2020, quote, that is the central contradiction of the whole case. Despite all the indications the killer was inside Faith's social circle, the DNA says the killer has to come from someone outside. Police also believe this was a crime of opportunity, not premeditated. And in 2017, still with no arrests having been made, they thought maybe this was not committed by a single person. Noted by Gasparoli, he reports that he believed that the killer was just outside Faith's closest friends and acquaintances. In his opinion, there's a good chance that this person didn't know Faith or investigators would know who it was. They may, however, have been acting out of anger at some grievance she caused to someone closer to her, as the note and violence of the crime imply. It was reported in a local publication that a reward was accumulated a few months after Faith's death, asking for any information on the crime. A grant from the office of Governor Bev Perdue brought the total reward fund for information leading to an arrest and conviction to $39,000, and Faith's mother, Connie Hedgepeth, worked to increase this sum. Hedgepeth said she approached the Chapel Hill Police Department about applying for additional reward money. It was something I had been asking for for two weeks after she died, and they finally asked for it, Hedgepeth said. Assuming there would be a quick arrest given the amount of DNA at the crime scene, Hedgepeth said that the police didn't think it would be needed, so they hadn't made an award fund a priority at first. In 2016, police released an image of what the killer may look like. This was created using the DNA from the semen they collected at the crime scene. This technology was created at the Parabon Nano Labs, which works with police departments from around the country using genetic testing. They believe the DNA came from a Latino man with dark hair and olive eyes. Finally, in 2021, after nine long years, a bit of hope for Faith's family. A shocking announcement was made. Police had arrested a suspect in the Faith Hedgepeth case, nine years after the crime was committed. 28-year-old Miguel Enrique Salguero Olivares was announced in connection to the murder of Faith. Authorities used DNA ancestry technology to find her killer using DNA found in her rape kit, an alcohol bottle, and a takeout bag with the vulgar message written by the killer. The technique identified the suspect's distant family members who shared his genetic information. Those relatives gave interviews and their DNA, which investigators say helped identify Salguero Olivares. Using this DNA sequencing technique, they finally matched a suspect in their database whose DNA had been put into the system a month earlier after being stopped for drunk driving. In North Carolina, law enforcement routinely takes DNA from people they arrest and feed them into a database to see if the DNA matches any pending cases. And in this one, it did. Reported in January 2022, the warrants for Salguero Olivares say that the DNA found at the crime scene is a probable match to the suspect, as is a palm print on the murder weapon, the Bacardi bottle, which matches the suspect's left palm. Investigators also went to the Salguero Olivares' apartment on Garrett Road in Durham. Using a search warrant, they seized six cell phones and a laptop. Authorities are investigating if the suspect has kept any memories or communications from the crime to further tie him to faith. North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein stressed the importance of DNA as evidence in a press briefing after the news of the arrest. He went on to explain that the state is prioritizing processing thousands of untested sexual assault kits in local law enforcement custody across North Carolina. He expressed appreciation to the legislature for passing the Survivor Act in 2019 and for putting in its current proposed budget an additional $9 million to outsource the remaining kits for testing. Stein said, given the dramatic increase in DNA to the state crime lab, the lab needs an additional 12 scientists to do the kind of important work that led to the arrest here today. I urge the legislature to fund these positions to keep the public safe. Salguero Olivares came to the U.S. from Guatemala when he was a teen in 2010, two years before Faith was killed. His most recent address was in Durham, where he worked as a painter. In 2012, he would have been 19 years old, the same age as Faith when she was killed. Salguero Olivares' mother told WRAL, a local news station in Raleigh, My son is not a murderer. I believe in my son. I believe it. He said he doesn't know the girl. She said he never attended UNC Chapel Hill and didn't have many friends at the university. A family friend of Salguero Olivares told WRAL that she also doesn't believe he could have done it. The heinous act does not fit the person she knows, pointing to principles passed down from his parents and grandparents. Police and prosecutors have declined to release many details about the investigation, including whether they know if Salguero Olivares knew Faith. They have also said that they don't know if there's a motive in the case. Glass, the private investigator for the Hedgepeths, told the local Raleigh news station that Salguero Olivares' name has come up as having been at a party in Hedgepeth's apartment complex, but he said he didn't stick out. Police have not confirmed any details about a party and whether Salguero Olivares was there. Glass also mentioned during his interview that he feels strongly that there were either other witnesses or at least others that haven't come forward that know something about the case but were afraid they would be implicated in it. 
Something else of note, Salguero Olivares apparently does not speak English fluently, even needing a translator at his first court appearance. How then would he have written that very clear note found at the crime scene? According to linguistic experts, contractions are complex for non-native English speakers, and I'm was used in the note. The spelling for the word jealous is considered more complicated as well. The Chapel Hill Police Department says this case is still an active investigation and ask the community for patience. Before this break in the case, Chapel Hill Assistant Chief of Police Salisa Lehu, who had led the investigation for six years, expressed in a statement how much the case has weighed on her. She said she thinks about faith and what next steps to take to solve it and give her family the peace they deserve. Continuing, she said, there are many people within our department and our agency partners who feel the same way. While Faith's family has been waiting for this day for nine years and nine days, I'm sure it is going to renew painful emotions. Our thoughts are with all of Faith's family and friends, and we will continue to support you in this difficult time. The most recent reposting on this case explains that while there's no indication when Salguero Olivares' case will officially be heard in Superior Court, the prosecution is not seeking the death penalty. Durham County District Attorney Satana DeBerry's office filed a motion to Superior Court on September 28, 2021, marking it as seeking a non-capital punishment for the alleged crimes. The most recent information of this case comes from reporting in April this year. Durham Assistant District Attorney Kendra Montgomery Blinn explained why the prosecution was taking so long to move forward with the case, saying that the discovery of the DNA match is extraordinary since it was a nine-year investigation with significant forensic testing. Montgomery Blinn told the judge that her office was still getting results back from the crime lab. She indicated how thorough the search for evidence has been, which involves translators and social media accounts. As of right now, authorities are still awaiting digital forensic analysis and cell extractions and digital social media and translation of audio, much still to be discovered it seems. Montgomery Blinn and Chief Public Defender Don Baxton are reviewing it to see if there will be additional forensic requests. As of this reporting, no trial has been set. Attempting to quell the flurry of agitations, anxieties, and anticipation the announcement of the arrest would surely bring, during a press conference, North Carolina Attorney General Stein offered soothing words to those in Faith's family and community. He said, while we understand nothing can fill the holes in your hearts, we hope that knowing a suspect has been arrested and is off the street reassures you that we are one step closer to justice for faith. The impact and grief in the Chapel Hill community is lasting. In 2016, her friend Rangel, who discovered the body alongside Rosario, was interviewed by ABC News, and she described the grief that Faith's passing had left. Rangel expressed how hard it's been to deal with her gone and the simple fact of missing her, not to mention the limbo state her friends and family have been living in knowing that her killer was still at large. As anyone who suffered a deep loss knows, it hurts. There's an active Facebook page and website, Justice for Faith, that is dedicated to remembering the life of and seeking, as the title implies, Justice for Faith. They even have a scholarship fund set up called Faith's Smile Memorial Scholarship, offering three $1,500 scholarships for the 2023 and 2024 school year. This growing fund is for college-bound women connected to a recognized Native American tribe in North Carolina by proven membership or ancestry. On the website, the family issued a statement in September 2021 following the arrest of Salguero Olivares. It states, We are relieved to know that someone has been arrested in Faith's case. We thank the members of the Chapel Hill Police Department, North Carolina, State Bureau of Investigation, and other agencies that had a hand in the investigation. We are grateful for all the support that we have received across the country over the past nine years. As we move into this next phase, we ask for your continued support, patience, and understanding as we limit commenting on the investigation. So many questions abound, like, how did Faith and Salguero Olivares know each other? Is he the only one that knew about this for the past 11 years? What are the details that police aren't telling us that would clinch the case? And could another suspect still be at large? The unanswered details of the case have us waiting in anticipation for what will be revealed or discovered. What do you think? Does the evidence prove that Salguero Olivares did it? And why the note? Do you have any different theories or strong hunches about the case? Let us know in the comments, and as always, thank you for tuning in to Killer Bites. I'm Lucy, and I'll see you on the next one. We've all met people who make the world a better place. The kind of people you just can't help but call a saint. And that's exactly the kind of person Eve Carson was. In 2008, Eve was a senior at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
Eve had a bright future ahead of her. It was Tuesday night, or rather early Wednesday morning on March 5th in 2008 when Eve was last seen alive. Her housemates were on their way to a party, but Eve, the good student she was, decided to spend the night at home studying. That was around 1.30 in the morning. Then around 5 a.m., a student placed a call to 911, claiming that she'd heard several gunshots coming from a wooded area behind her neighborhood and what sounded like a young woman screaming. An officer was dispatched to the area. As he was crossing Hillcrest Road and Hillcrest Circle, he saw something in the road. It was the body of a female. The officer said he remembered the body was tilted on her left hip and that her right arm was bent behind her head. He wasn't sure who she was, but he suspected she was also the one who was reported to have screamed because she had multiple bullet wounds. Eve's roommates called the Chapel Hill Police Department on March 6, worried that they hadn't seen their friend in over 24 hours. When they came into the station, they were asked to identify the female's body. They were able to confirm that it was Eve. But what had happened in the four hours between the roommates leaving the house and the officer finding Eve's body in the road? Since Eve had been last seen doing work on her computer at her house on Friendly Lane, the police began investigations by looking at her computer history. According to the timestamps, her last activity was at 3.37 a.m. Police got a hold of other accounts and documents of the victim, including her bank information. She had made an ATM withdrawal at a machine located just a few miles away from her house at University Mall in Chapel Hill. So maybe Eve went to go get some money and that's when she was attacked? Except records say she made yet another ATM withdrawal within the hour, this time at a machine a little further from campus. What's even more suspicious was five more attempts were made that night, all at different ATMs and not just in Chapel Hill. One of the last transactions that was denied was at an ATM all the way in Durham, North Carolina. Police also got a 911 call reporting an abandoned vehicle, a 2005 Toyota Highlander. It was found less than a mile from the wooded area where gunshots were reported to have been heard. In an interview with one of the roommates, they said they got home around 4.30 that morning and Eve was nowhere to be seen, and neither was her car, a 2005 Toyota Highlander. Police believed Eve had been a victim of a robbery, and then somehow murder. They pulled up surveillance videos of all the ATMs that whoever had stolen Eve's card had tried to make withdrawals out of. Many of the machines didn't have cameras, and the ones that did were of little help. However, one of the videos was able to capture the culprit, or shall I say, culprits. In a drive through ATM, the footage showed a man sitting behind the steering wheel of a 2005 Toyota Highlander. The police definitely had their suspect. Though the quality of the video wasn't great, they could even make out a figure moving in the back seat of the vehicle, maybe even a third passenger. The footage was too grainy to tell. Could one of those people be Eve? Over the course of the next couple days, Eve's card would continue to be used to try and withdraw more money from her account. On March 6th at 2.16 a.m., someone made a total of three transactions at the Northgate Mall ATM in Durham. They all amounted to $700, Eve's daily limit again. The person tried to use the card again another three times and was unsuccessful. At this point, Eve's bank had placed a hold on her account, so the men weren't getting any more money out of their victim. Finally, on March 7th, someone made two attempts to withdraw money at a convenience store in Durham, and this machine was equipped with a security camera. The video showed a different man than before using the machine. So now the police had reason to believe that there were two people responsible, at least for the robbery, if not also the killing of Eve. Eve's autopsy report also came in, and it painted a gruesome picture of her death. Eve was shot. Based on the forensic evidence, she was first shot in her right shoulder, then her right upper arm, the right side of her rear, and her right cheek. The bullet wounds matched that of a 25 caliber handgun. The coroner also found blood in her lungs, which they said indicated that Eve had still been alive and breathing. It was the fifth shot that would prove to be fatal, and it wasn't done with a handgun. It was done with a off shotgun. They found wounds in both her right hand and her right temple, 
which police believed meant that she tried to shield herself. The bullet went straight through her hand and into her brain. And according to a forensic psychologist, they said the manner in which Eve had been shot showed a complete lack of regard for another person. Why would someone target a student and do this to them? Just for some money? Through enhanced imaging software, police were able to edit the surveillance footage and get a clearer image of the two men. Eventually, they had two suspects, DeMario James Atwater and Lawrence Alvin Lovett Jr. Both men were from Durham, and they both had extensive criminal histories. They had also issued an arrest warrant for Lawrence, whom they believed was the person in the driver's seat at the first ATM. However, they wouldn't detain him until the next day. Once both men were in custody, they were charged with first-degree murder, and Lawrence was also charged with the first-degree murder of a Pijit. Neither would appear in court until over a year later, as prosecutors and defense teams gathered information regarding the case. As evidence was reviewed, prosecutors began piecing together the timeline of events. They received a testimony from Jason McNeil, a friend of Lawrence, that helped them understand what Eve's last hours alive were like. On the night of March 4th, Lawrence had called Jason, asking him to give him and his friend Rio, who police suspected was a nickname for DiMario, a ride to Chapel Hill. He was going to rob someone. However, Jason said no, so Lawrence decided to drive his mother's car instead. He and DiMario parked in a neighborhood near the campus and searched for a victim. Police heard another testimony that a female student actually saw the two men that night when she was in her own vehicle talking on the phone. She said she felt unsafe, so she'd driven away, but said she saw the men turn the corner on Friendly Lane, where Eve's house was located. Some sources say that Lawrence and DiMario saw Eve in the window, home alone. They broke into the residence and kidnapped Eve, forcing her to give them the keys to her car and that they drove away to withdraw money from various ATMs. This would match with the report that one of the roommates gave to the police that said, when they arrived home at 4.30 that morning, the door was wide open, Eve's car was gone, and she was nowhere to be found. Another narrative that I read from multiple sources was that Lawrence and DiMario actually saw Eve walking to her car that night. They saw the opportunity and forced their way into her vehicle, with Lawrence getting in the driver's seat and DiMario holding Eve at gunpoint in the back seat. With either story, it shows that Eve was a victim of opportunity rather than deliberately targeted. According to Jason's account, Eve begged for her life and even tried to reason with Lawrence and DiMario. Apparently, the captors had decided to kill her because she'd seen their faces. When the car pulled up to a densely wooded area, Eve realized she was going to die. This is when police learned the heartbreaking truth of Eve's final moments. She knew they were going to kill her, and instead of turning to anger or violence, you know what she did? She asked Lawrence and DiMario to pray with her. They were unmoved by her request, and that's when they proceeded to callously take her life. Prosecutors not only charged the two men with her murder, but also added charges of first-degree kidnapping and armed robbery. Because both Lawrence and DiMario were felons at the time of the crime, they were also charged with possession of a firearm as a felon, felonious larceny, and felonious stolen goods. And because DiMario had used a set-off shotgun, he also faced an indictment of possession of a weapon of mass destruction. The Supreme Court ruled on a case that deemed sentencing life in prison without parole to defendants who were under 18 at the time of the crime as cruel and unusual punishment. So the North Carolina Court of Appeal ordered a new sentencing hearing for Lawrence's case. On June 3, 2013, the now 23-year-old appeared for a resentencing hearing. He stood by his claim to innocence, but this time he spoke to the judge saying, you know, people make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. I'm not the monster that y'all made me out to be. Still, the judge again sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Lawrence decided to appeal his new sentence. He argued that he and his legal team hadn't been aware of the Supreme Court's case, nor that there would be state laws prohibiting life without parole sentences for juveniles convicted of crimes that weren't first-degree murders. He said that had he known about these, he would have made different trial decisions, like focusing more on the first-degree murder indictment and pleading guilty to all the other charges. Lawrence also claimed that he had been unfairly portrayed as corrupt and cruel to the judge, 
And because he was not those things, his life sentence could actually be considered cruel and unusual. Since his incarceration, he has committed seven infractions. These include threatening to harm staff, disobeying orders, associating with gangs, using profane language, and possessing substances. In the end, the total amount Lawrence and Mario had stolen from Eve's bank account was $1,400. Was it worth it? I'm definitely not saying that there's any amount of money that would have warranted Eve's murder, but I just have to wonder if you told DeMario or Lawrence that they would kill a promising young woman and steal $1,400 from her, would they still have gone through with it? Although the killers were caught, the loss of Eve still weighed heavy on the hearts of the UNC community. On March 8th, the men's basketball team had a moment of silence to honor Eve before their game. And for the rest of the season, the men's and women's basketball teams wore a black badge on their jerseys that said Eve. The university also established the Eve Carson Scholarship, honoring Eve's wish to create more financial assistance to junior students who are recognized for their service to the school. The scholarship is awarded to two juniors, funding half the tuition for their final year at UNC. It also provides the recipient with a $5,000 stipend to spend for a summer enrichment experience. The scholarship committee is entirely student-run, and the tagline for the scholarship is Students Celebrating Students, embodying Eve's value of amplifying student voices on campus. And every year, the Eve Carson Memorial 5K for Education is hosted by UNC, reminding people how much Eve valued physical exercise as well as learning. The money that's raised at this event is donated to the Eve Carson Scholarship Fund, as well as other philanthropic organizations. The university also honored her plan to establish a distinguished lecture series. UNC made sure that even in death, Eve's devotion to education and community service would live on. At graduation, the school named Eve as the winner of two awards, the Chancellor's Award, which recognized her as the most outstanding woman in the senior class, and the General Alumni Association's Distinguished Young Alumnus Award. And for the first time in UNC's history, they presented her family with a double major degree, which Eve was supposed to achieve that year. As the years passed, UNC refused to let Eve be forgotten. To commemorate the second anniversary of her death, the school created the Eve Marie Carson Garden. Inscribed on one of the walls of the garden is a quote from Eve. Learn from every single being, experience, and moment. What joy it is to search for lessons and goodness and enthusiasm in others. The garden is dedicated not only to Eve, but also to all students before and after her who pass away before their graduation. Even today, you can find her public obituary page online and read the thousands of comments people wrote about how she had a positive impact on their lives. A lot of people said that Eve's death could have been prevented. They point at the faults of the justice system, letting DeMario's other case get mishandled, resulting in him being out on probation instead of being locked up sooner, or Lawrence's trial and then mistrial and how his evidence was handled. Critics say with a more efficient and competent judicial system, some of these events could have been avoided, including Eve's murder. The North Carolina General Assembly passed a law that ensured that specific procedures and penalties would be followed for cases relating to criminal gang activity. It was named the North Carolina Street Gang Suppression Act. Legislators hoped it would prevent crimes like the one DeMario and Lawrence had committed from happening in the future through more thorough procedures in the justice system. Regardless of who's to blame, this case is a painful reminder that bad things happen to good people. Eve was a light in the world, and her light was snuffed out too soon in a senseless crime, a robbery that ended in murder. With that being said, I'm Brandy, and I want to thank you for joining me on another episode of Killer Bites. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time. Jose Menendez was living the ultimate American dream. After moving to the United States from Cuba, he got married, had two sons, and scored a big time entertainment job in Hollywood. But all of that was about to be ripped away from him. On one August day, Jose's sons, Eric and Lyle, walked into their family home with rifles and fired at their parents. The police talked to one of their neighbors who mentioned hearing bullet-like sounds around 10 p.m. The police first thought Jose and Kitty's slayings were the work of organized crime, 
But as they continued to investigate, they found out about some business rivals of Jose's that could have been out to get him too. After the slayings, the brothers set it up to look like a mob hit and pretended to mourn their parents' passing. And they were bawling out with their dad's money. Over the next six months, Eric and Lyle spent almost one million dollars. Lyle bought three Rolexes the day before his parents' funeral. Oh, and at the funeral, Lyle read a letter that his dad wrote him right before he was slain. He said, I encourage you not to select the easy road. I encourage you to walk the road with honor, regardless of the consequences, and to challenge yourself to excellence. I believe that you will. Well, Eric and Lyle must have a different definition of the word excellence, because what they did was awful. But the whole consequence thing was spot on. They clearly didn't care about consequences at all. Okay, so after Lyle bought the Rolexes, he also bought a Porsche, a bunch of nice clothes, and a hot wing restaurant back in Princeton. Eric bought a Jeep Wrangler, hired a personal tennis coach for $50,000, and invested $40,000 in a rock concert that never happened. Instead of staying at their family mansion in Beverly Hills, both boys decided to live in adjoining condos near Marina Del Rey. Which doesn't really make sense to me, because their mansion was hella nice. I mean, it was over $14 million, so it had to be luxurious. But maybe it was too much for the boys to be living at the scene of the crime? Who am I kidding? It doesn't really seem like they cared. So Eric and Lyle wined and dined at a bunch of fancy restaurants, went on vacations to the Caribbean and London, shelled out a bunch of money on parties, and would even take their mom's Mercedes convertible out for a spin. Wait, I thought Eric just bought a Jeep. Why would he need to drive his mom's whip? Maybe they were just really committing to the whole rich thing where people drive around different cars depending on their mood. If I had that money, I would buy a room full of dogs for each day of the week. Anyway, Eric and Lyle acted like they had won the lottery and they were expecting to get even more money from their dad's insurance policy. So they had no financial worries in the world. Well, I think we know the motive behind all of this now. And it seems like Eric and Lyle have absolutely no remorse over it either. In an interview with a reporter, Eric said that if he and Lyle were at the house during the attack, they would have tried everything to stop it. Uh, really? Because last time I checked, you were at the house and you were the ones who attacked them. When asked about his goals, Eric said he wanted to be a senator and Lyle wanted to be the president of the United States so the two of them could liberate Cuba, their father's home country. Okay, now they're fronting too hard. What happened to playing tennis and making movies? Dr. Ozeal was eventually able to get both boys to confess. Eric said they did it to put their mother out of her misery, but Lyle made it seem like a more aggressive act. Dr. Ozeal's mistress overheard the recording of the session and went to the police to rat the brothers out. What happened to the whole confidentiality thing? Well, I guess when you're dealing with people taking lives, that just goes out the window. But if it was the mistress that told on them, I wonder what Dr. Ozeal had to say about all of this. Apparently, Dr. Ozeal and his lady had a rough relationship. The woman reported that her therapist boo was super controlling and aggressive. She claimed he beat her on multiple occasions, and one of his attacks is actually what spurred her to go to the police to report the confessions. An abusive therapist? That's a new one. So, once the police were tipped off, they arrested Lyle. This was on March 8, 1990. Eric was in Israel for a tennis tournament at the time, but a few days later, he voluntarily came home and was arrested. The brothers were separated from each other and held without bail while they awaited their trial. Right after the arrest, officials found out that Eric had written a screenplay with his best friend, Craig. The screenplay, which was titled Friends, was about a young man who snuffed his parents for the inheritance money. 
Hmm. Uh, that sounds familiar. Oh yeah, because that's what happened in real life. The judge didn't allow Eric's script to be introduced as evidence at the trial, but his co-writer and best friend Craig testified on the stand saying Eric confessed the crimes to him. Speaking of evidence, the defense tried to say the therapist tapes couldn't be considered since they broke doctor-patient confidentiality, but the judge on their case deemed two of the three tapes as admissible evidence since Lyle had threatened Dr. Ozeal. The process of determining the validity of these tapes as evidence took forever. Well, it took 30 months, but you get the point. The trial began in 1993 and was actually broadcasted on cable TV. Because of that, this case gained a huge following. People were so infatuated by the story. And I mean, do you blame them? It's probably better than any scandalous television show at the time. A wealthy Beverly Hills family with two mysterious brothers who brutally slayed their parents? Yeah, that's pretty engaging. Since they couldn't really claim innocence, the rich and fancy sweater-wearing brothers went a different route. They said their dad had abused them throughout their whole childhood. The jury was super confused at this point. I mean, how do you prosecute two young men who iced their allegedly abusive parents? And how do they even know the truth about those allegations? Well, the first trial lasted four and a half months, and the jury couldn't make up their minds, so they declared a mistrial. Months later, the Menendez brothers went to trial again. This time, it wasn't televised, and I bet people were pissed they couldn't tune in. At the retrial, Eric and Lyle stuck to their abuse claim, but after five months in court, they were both found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. Despite their request to stay together, the boys were split up and sent to different prisons. During their time in jail, they actually both got married. Eric married a woman named Tammy, who was his prison pen pal. Their ceremony was in the waiting room of the jail, and their wedding cake was a Twinkie. And no, I'm not making that up. It was literally a Twinkie from a vending machine at the prison. Honestly, I kind of vibe with it and it's much cheaper than getting a custom cake. Maybe I'll do that for my wedding. Eric and Tammy were even able to kiss at their ceremony. How cute. During their regular visits, the couple was allowed to hold hands, but they were only permitted to hug and kiss at the end. Tammy once said in an interview, the holding of the hands during the visit is everything. Ah yes, holding hands really gets me going. All right, that's enough of Eric's love story. Let's move on to Lyle. Lyle actually married two different women. He first tied the knot with a former Playboy model who ended up divorcing him once she found out he was writing to other women. OMG. I love how writing a letter is seen as cheating when you're in a prison relationship. Lyle's second wife was a woman named Rebecca who he had known years before his arrest. Rebecca was a magazine editor when Lyle met her, but she went on to become an attorney. I don't know if I'd want her as my lawyer. Do people like being represented by the spouses of big time criminals? Is that a thing? Eric and Lyle stayed in separate prisons for over 20 years before they were reunited in 2018. During their time apart, they couldn't talk on the phone, but they were able to write letters. They even had a chess game going through the mail. Like, they would write their moves on a piece of paper and send them back and forth. That had to be the longest game of chess ever. When the guards opened the door for the brothers to meet for the first time in decades, they burst into tears. Now, they're able to see each other all the time in jail. They eat their meals together and hang out at the exercise yard. If that's not sibling goals, I don't know what is. Actually, every other pair of siblings who haven't slain their parents. The story of the Menendez brothers has been retold in many TV shows, movies, and comedy skits. People just can't get enough. I can't either. 
It's such an interesting turn of events with family drama, relationship troubles, spending sprees, sketchy therapists, and prison weddings. And can we talk about how iconic the whole Twinkie thing is? That part really sealed the deal for me. And now I'm craving something sweet, like this pie. See you next time. It seems like half the time I see the news, it's about troubled teens and how our future generations are doomed. They're too obsessed with technology. They lack certain common sense skills. They're buying too much avocado toasts and not enough blood diamonds. But that's all harmless stuff when you really think about it. Sure, kids these days may know more about TikTok than they do about doing their taxes, but that's nothing compared to what this episode is about. Today, we'll be reviewing a case that features a much more sinister story of a teenage delinquent. This time, it isn't a TikTok trend or prank gone wrong. Instead, it involves the life and death of a nine-year-old girl, all at the hands of a 15-year-old. This is the story of how Alyssa Bustamante brutally murdered her neighbor, Elizabeth Olton. I'm Brandy, and you're watching Killer Bites, the show giving you bite-sized coverage of the hottest true crime cases. On Wednesday, October 21st, 2009, after the sun had gone down, 911 received a call from a frantic mother, Patricia, in St. Martins, Missouri. She claimed her nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Olton, hadn't returned home after playing at a friend's house about an hour before. Having only been gone an hour, you might think Patricia was overreacting. Maybe Elizabeth had just decided to stay longer at her friend's house. Maybe she took a detour and was just taking a little longer than expected to get home. But Patricia said she had a bad feeling. She'd already tried calling her daughter's cell phone numerous times with no answer. And when she called the neighbors where Elizabeth was supposed to have gone to play with her friend, they claimed that they hadn't seen Elizabeth that day. On top of all that, Patricia insisted that Elizabeth was deathly afraid of the dark and definitely would have returned home before sundown. So the police arrived at the house, and like Patricia had said, Elizabeth was nowhere to be found. By 10 p.m., the police, joined by volunteers from the community, were searching the entire neighborhood. St. Martin's was a small town, with a population just over a thousand people. So the whole town probably knew Elizabeth and were concerned for her well-being. And you would think with the number of people involved that they would find Elizabeth easily. I mean, she was only nine years old. How far could she have gone? But after hours of looking and still no sign of her, everyone was growing more and more concerned. Police contacted the cell phone company of Elizabeth's phone, hoping to locate her by tracking the device. Like I said, Patricia had already tried calling her daughter's cell phone many times that night, but every time the call just went straight to voicemail. Had Elizabeth's phone died? Was she ignoring her mother's calls? Or was it something even more dark? Had someone intentionally turned off or destroyed Elizabeth's phone so that the calls wouldn't even go through? The phone company was able to ping her location and they sent the results to the police. Strangely enough, her phone seemed to be located somewhere in the woods behind the house. So the search parties started combing through the wooded area. In the meantime, police filed a missing persons report on Elizabeth and sent it out to neighborhood law enforcement agencies and the FBI. They set up road checkpoints for vehicles going in and out of the area. They contacted local registered sex offenders to see if they knew anything about the whereabouts of the child. They even had planes and helicopters scanning the area, anything to try to locate her. It was Thursday, nearly 24 hours had passed. Missouri State Highway Patrol Sergeant David Rice was assigned to the case and he decided to interview the last known person to ever see Elizabeth, her neighborhood friend, Emma. In her interview, Emma said she went to Elizabeth's house and asked if she could play around 5 p.m. At first, Patricia was hesitant to let her daughter go so close to dinner time, but Elizabeth promised to be home before dark, so Patricia said yes. Off the two girls went back to Emma's house to play in the driveway. It started to get dark. Elizabeth said it was time for her to go home. From the edge of the driveway, Emma unknowingly watched her friend walk back to her house for the last time as the sun began to set. Emma said she continued to play outside for a little bit, but got stuck in some thorn bushes. As she tried to wrangle free, she called out for help 
and that's when her older sister, Alyssa, came out and helped her. Emma noticed her sister had some blood on her pants, and when she asked her about it, Alyssa simply said she was on her period, and that was that. Emma's alibi didn't arouse any suspicion, but wanting to be thorough, the police also brought the older sister in for questioning. They had no idea they were so close to solving the case. Meet Alyssa Bustamante. In 2009, she's 15 years old, the oldest of four siblings, and an active member in her local church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. However, she has a tragic past. In her early years, she grew up in a home with substance abuse and instability. Her mom, Michelle, battled drug addiction, and Alyssa's father, Caesar, was in and out of prison with an extensive criminal record that included multiple charges of assault. Alyssa's mom had her when she was only 15 years old, and later she would have three more kids, twin boys and the younger sister, Emma. During Alyssa's time under their care, she experienced a lot of abuse. Worried about their grandchildren's safety, Michelle's parents, Karen and Gary Brooke, requested custody of the kids. They became the kids' legal guardians in 2002. Alyssa was eight. This was probably the first time Alyssa ever experienced a stable and supportive home life. But was it too late? While her younger siblings seemed to thrive in their new living situation, Alyssa had trouble adjusting. She started exhibiting signs of post-traumatic stress and developed an abhorrence for violence. Had she already been too traumatized by the chaos of her mother and father's lifestyles to acclimate to routine and dependency on her grandparents? Well, if you look at Alyssa's mental health history and academic records, you get conflicting answers. On the one hand, Alyssa got good grades, maintaining a B average, and she didn't have a history with any behavioral issues in an academic setting. She had a boyfriend named Dustin and a best friend named Jennifer. However, she still struggled with her mental health. Alyssa was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and experienced major depressive episodes. She engaged in a form of self-harm known as cutting. A cutter is someone who deals with emotional pain by cutting and inflicting physical pain on themselves, usually by using tools like razor blades or scissors. Friends and family really started noticing changes in Alyssa in 2007 when she was hospitalized after attempting to take her own life. At only 13 years old, she received extensive treatment, both in and out patient care, and was prescribed the medication Prozac. She visited a psychiatrist regularly, and her grandparents said that she spent a lot of time alone, often taking walks in the woods or spending time in her room. And Alyssa was pretty open about the dark emotions she felt. On both her YouTube channel and her Twitter account, she listed cutting and killing people as her hobbies in her bios. In one of her videos, she touches an electric cattle fence that surrounded her grandparents' property. She shrieks after coming in contact with the wire, and then she encourages her brothers to do the same. Just before they reach for the fencing, Alyssa edits in some text in the video that says, this is where it gets good. This is where my brothers get hurt. I guess Alyssa grew out of her abhorrence for violence. On her Twitter, she posted things like, this is all I want in life, a reason for all this pain, and bad decisions make great stories. Once at her own 15th birthday party, she turned to her friend Jennifer and said that she wondered what it would be like to kill someone. Now, I know it seems like all these things would be major red flags for a fledgling teen serial killer, but I'll be honest, Without all the context we have now, I'm not sure I would have suspected anything. I've met kids nowadays who have that emo, nihilistic aesthetic. Maybe listing your hobbies as cutting and killing people would be something to raise your eyebrow at, but some of the other stuff she posted on social media seemed like pretty normal, dark and brooding stuff teenagers post. Maybe that's saying more about the kids I meet than it does about what a typical American teen is like, but I guess what I'm trying to say is some of the stuff doesn't scream murderer to me. Police weren't necessarily convinced she had some sinister connection to the case when they first interviewed her either. They didn't know Alyssa and when they met her, she just seemed like your typical angsty teenager going through an emo phase. Sure, it was kind of weird that she had blood on her pants. And yeah, her alibi was a little odd when she told the detective that she was out in the woods at the time of the disappearance, but she didn't appear to have anything to hide. She said she barely even knew Elizabeth since she was her younger sister's friend, not hers. She seemed calm and collected. 
Police continued their search for Elizabeth in the woods. Eventually, one of the volunteers stumbled upon something strange, a rectangular-sized hole on the forest floor. A grave, you could even call it. Maybe even the perfect size for a nine-year-old's body. Finding that out in the middle of the woods while you're looking for a missing child is frightening to say the least. If I was that volunteer, I know I would be freaking out and thinking the worst. But when the authorities began investigating the dig site, they didn't find anything to suggest Elizabeth had been there or any sort of bodily remains or anything. So I guess it really was just a hole in the middle of the woods. Alyssa was brought to the potential crime scene and Sergeant Rice overheard her say that she was the person who dug the hole. Sergeant Rice asked her why she dug it in the first place and she simply said, I just like digging holes. As if she isn't claiming to have dug the very hole that's currently being investigated for a homicide case. She claimed that she dug holes all the time and sometimes she would bury dead animals in them when she found them in the woods. That definitely got law enforcement's attention and the FBI obtained a search warrant to investigate the Bustamante home. This included Alyssa's room. As they searched the home, they found some chilling stuff in the 15 year old's bedroom. To start, Alyssa's room was a pigsty. Dirty clothes on the floor, bits of trash everywhere, empty cups and dishes all over the room. It's not too alarming that a teenager's room is messy, but what the police also found were messages all over the walls, and they were pretty creepy too. Some were written in pen or pencil, but others were written in some sort of red fluid. Could Alyssa have been writing things in her own blood? There were also notes taped to the walls. They were letters between her and her father, who was still in prison. Again, it's not a crime for a girl wanting to connect with her father, even if he's a convict. But the cherry on top had to be the disturbing drawing police found on the wall. It looked like a crudely drawn human body with slice and slash marks on the limbs of the figure. And there was a name written next to the sketch, Emma. Yeah, that's right, Alyssa's own sister. There's no sources to confirm that Alyssa's depictions were illustrating Emma being harmed, but it definitely wasn't a flattering portrait. Lastly, and really most importantly, the police found Alyssa's diary. Typically, a diary is where a teenage girl writes her thoughts and feelings about her life. Maybe she talks about a crush she has at school or a fight she's having with her best friend, but Alyssa wasn't our typical girl. As the authorities looked through the diary, they found disturbing entries about this troubled teen's innermost thoughts. In one entry, she wrote about a desire to burn a house down and kill everyone inside. In another entry, written a week before Elizabeth disappeared, Alyssa wrote, if I don't talk about it, I bottle it up. And when I explode, someone's gonna die. The final entry in the journal was dated Wednesday, October 21st, the day of the disappearance. But whatever Alyssa wrote, she didn't want anyone to read. She'd scribbled over her writing so that almost all the words were indecipherable. Almost. They could make out the last sentence, which read, K, I gotta go to church now, lol. And when the police held the paper up to the light, they could make out two words, slit throat. The next day, Friday, Alyssa was brought in for questioning again. It had been two days since Elizabeth went missing and authorities still hadn't found her body. Her grandmother accompanied her. Because Alyssa was a minor, she was assigned a juvenile counselor who was also present during the interrogation. She was brought to FBI headquarters and this time Sergeant Rice did the interview and he had a plan. At this point, he had strong evidence that linked Alyssa to Elizabeth's disappearance. Now he just needed her to tell him what happened. Earlier, the police also conducted an interrogation on her boyfriend, Dustin. Why? Well, on the night of the 911 call, when police were gathering eyewitness statements, a few people mentioned seeing a hooded figure at the edge of the woods close to the highway. At the time, police thought nothing of it, but now that Alyssa was one of their main suspects, they thought maybe there were multiple people involved, and Alyssa's boyfriend fit the description. First, they performed a polygraph test on him. Polygraphs can measure a test subject's heartbeat and compare it to times when it is baseline, as a control group, and when it's changed. For example, increased heart rate can be a common response when a person is lying. However, they've been known to be unreliable since multiple factors can interfere with the accuracy of the results, like being anxious. Whether Dustin was just nervous or he was hiding something, the investigators were confident he knew more than he was letting on. In the interrogation, the detective used an intimidation tactic. 
He entered the room and told Dustin they already had evidence that linked his girlfriend to the crime. At the time, they definitely had suspicion, especially given the journal entry, but they didn't have a confession. So the detective asked Dustin what he knew and if he had any involvement. At first, Dustin played dumb, but later, when Sergeant Rice took over the questioning, Dustin gave in. On October 22nd, the day after Elizabeth disappeared, Alyssa showed up at Dustin's house and told him what she'd done. Though he claimed he was present when the murder took place, he said he lied out of fear of what Alyssa would do if she found out he'd reported her. Prior to Alyssa's second interrogation, police also recovered the missing entry from Alyssa's diary. They'd sent the journal to be further analyzed, and its contents were the nail in the coffin, so to speak, that the police needed to link Alyssa to Elizabeth's case. It read, I just f***ing killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, LOL. What horrifies people most when they hear about this case is the flippant, almost boasting tone Alyssa's writing has. It's the voice of a teenage girl who's proud of committing murder. Where's the remorse? Where's the guilt? Does she not understand the consequences of her actions? A girl's life was senselessly taken from her. Why did Alyssa do it? That's what the police wanted to know. What was her motive? What reason could she possibly have had to kill a child? Sergeant Rice began the interrogation with a light and casual tone. He asked Alyssa to explain what she did the day of the murder. Calmly, she said that she got home from school around 3.30 p.m., hung out in her room for a bit, then decided to go out for a walk in the woods around 5.30 p.m. The detective had a map of the area, including the woods, and had Alyssa point out the general route she took. Then around 6.30 p.m., she headed back. Once she got home, she heard Emma crying for help. Just like in Emma's story, there was blood on Alyssa's pants, and she dismissed it as period blood to Sergeant Rice. Nowhere in her alibi did she mention coming into contact with Elizabeth. But as her interrogation continued, her story would change. The investigator asked Alyssa to describe Elizabeth. She said she didn't know the girl very well. She was her younger sister's friend, and from what she recalled, she was a sort of girly girl. When Sergeant Rice suggested that maybe Alyssa ran into Elizabeth in the woods while the little girl headed home, Alyssa denied this and said Elizabeth wasn't the type of girl to be out in nature. Speaking of which, the detective shifted the subject to the hole Alyssa had dug. Alyssa claimed that she'd dug the hole a couple days before, maybe Sunday, she said. But when she was asked to elaborate what she did on Sunday and Alyssa consulted with her grandmother, she realized that it couldn't have been then because she was away from home all day and didn't return until after it had gotten dark. So then she said Friday. She said she dug the hole then and it was just for fun. But the detective had reason to believe maybe someone helped her dig the hole. Alyssa insisted that she did it alone, but Sergeant Rice wondered if she was protecting someone. When the detective asked the teen how she felt about the whole situation, rather than commenting on how she felt, Alyssa responded more cognitively. She commented on how many people were involved in the search for Elizabeth, or how worried the parents seemed. And when Sergeant Rice asked her what she thought had happened to the nine-year-old girl, Alyssa said it was likely that she'd been kidnapped. The detective noticed that Alyssa's answers were were more focused on describing what she thought rather than a more emotional response about how she felt. This could be because she was trying to distance herself from the crime, but it came across as her seeming to be very cold and indifferent to a possible neighborhood kidnapping. Sergeant Rice knew silence was a very effective interrogation tactic. It made subjects feel uncomfortable and often forced them to remain present during an interview rather than disassociate and hide behind a persona like they could when engaging in conversation. As the interrogation continued, Sergeant Rice slipped in longer and longer moments of silence, sometimes more than a minute long. And every time he could see Alyssa show more and more signs that suggested she was guilty. You can see a noticeable shift in her body language when she found out about the search warrant. This was news to Alyssa. She knew they'd searched her room, but she had no idea they'd actually found anything that she thought could link her to the case. You can tell from her face that she knew what was in that diary, and so did Sergeant Rice. 
It seems the only person who didn't know is Karen, the grandmother. Sergeant Rice told Alyssa that when it comes to writing on a piece of paper, even if you erase it, even if you try to scribble it out with a pen, the writing can still be recovered. And Alyssa was just stunned into silence. That's when the juvenile counselor decided to step in. And this is actually a key moment in Alyssa's case, as we'll see when we cover her court proceedings. The counselor explained that she was there to protect Alyssa, but in order to do that, Alyssa needed to tell the truth and tell the investigator exactly what happened. And Alyssa began to tear up. And suddenly she recalled that actually, yes, she had seen Elizabeth in the woods. Even though earlier in the interview, Alyssa was confident that she'd barely met the girl, now she claimed that they'd hung out in the woods for a little bit. Long enough that while they were walking together, Elizabeth accidentally tripped and hit her head on a rock. And that's when she tragically passed, according to Alyssa. She probably thought that if Elizabeth's death were an accident, it would give her a better chance at a lighter punishment. She said that after Elizabeth died, she panicked and decided to burn Elizabeth's body. That's why the police couldn't find it, because Alyssa burned Elizabeth's body and spread her ashes in a nearby river. This sudden and convenient flood of memories was a surprise to everyone in the room, but the investigator saw right through it. He knew what Alyssa had done, all thanks to the journal. The investigator knew it wasn't an accident. He knew she didn't burn Elizabeth's body, and he told Alyssa that. It's actually very difficult to burn a body to ash. Even crematoriums need high-powered special machinery, let alone a high schooler left to their own devices in the woods. So now she had straight up lied to a detective's face and was caught. I'm sure she knew she was in trouble. All the while, the grandmother grew more and more concerned. She had walked into the room thinking her granddaughter was completely innocent, and now she was learning that she was actually involved in a horrific accident and tampered with a dead body? Could it get any worse? Unfortunately, it did. The detective pressed on. He asked Alyssa what she did with the body, or more specifically, what she did to the body. Did she slit Elizabeth's throat? Alyssa froze. Now she knew that the police had pieced together her written confession despite her efforts to erase it. She nodded. There was a moment of silence in the room. Then it was broken by a wail from her grandmother who was horrified that her granddaughter was capable of carrying out such a vicious act. The grandmother was escorted out of the room, but for the rest of the interrogation video, you can still hear her shrieks of anguish and see the effect it has on Alyssa. Despite Alyssa's terrible deeds, you can tell she cared about her grandmother, and seeing her so upset affected Alyssa. It's just a shame she couldn't extend the same sympathy for her neighbor. With only Alyssa, Detective Rice, and the juvenile counselor in the room, and the confession in hand, it was time to get motive, the why. Alyssa admitted that it was actually her idea that Emma invite Elizabeth over to play. This meant that Alyssa had targeted Elizabeth from the beginning. It wasn't just a wrong place at the wrong time situation. Alyssa had chosen her victim ahead of time. You might be thinking, why didn't Emma mention to the police that it was Alyssa's idea that Emma invite Elizabeth over to play? But if you think about it, why would Emma think that's important? As far as she was concerned, it didn't matter whose idea it was to invite her friend over. Once Emma came back with Elizabeth, Alyssa sent her little sister away and told Elizabeth that she had something cool to show her in the woods. As Elizabeth followed her friend's older sister into the trees, she had no idea that Alyssa was hiding a kitchen knife on her. Once they were deep enough into the forest, Alyssa grabbed hold of Elizabeth by the neck and strangled her. Then she took the knife and slit the little girl's throat. As if that wasn't enough, Alyssa said she stabbed her. When the investigator asked her how many times she stabbed Elizabeth, Alyssa said twice, but an autopsy report would reveal it was actually eight times. Then Alyssa claimed she dug the hole. But Sergeant Rice didn't buy that either. How did she dig the hole if she didn't have a shovel? Again, Alyssa was caught in a lie. She backtracked. She actually dug the hole on Friday, like she said before. This may seem like an innocuous distinction. I mean, who cares when she dug the hole? Isn't it more important that she murdered someone? But that small change in the story further supported the evidence that by digging the hole five days prior, Alyssa's crime was premeditated. It wasn't just some spur of the moment killing. 
Alyssa had five whole days to change her mind about taking someone's life, but she didn't. And because of that, an innocent young girl was killed. After all that, Alyssa said she walked home, washed off the knife, and left it in the kitchen sink and went to church. But the question still remained, where was Elizabeth's body? That's when Alyssa revealed that she'd actually dug two holes. She said the first one she dug, the one the volunteer found, was too shallow. She started digging only to realize the dirt was too hard for her to dig any further. When she dug the second one, she ran into the same problem. The soon-to-be grave was too shallow. But I guess she got too impatient and decided to use it anyway because she said that's where Elizabeth's body would still be. A lot of people are hung up on the two holes Alyssa dug. Did she really just start digging one, stop because the ground got too hard, and dig another? Or was there a more malicious reasoning behind it? Many people theorize that Alyssa might have had plans to actually kill her twin brothers, but settled on Elizabeth for some reason instead. Maybe it was because she could justify killing a neighbor over her own family, but if you ask me, there's no justification for taking someone's life, blood-related or not. After her interrogation, Sergeant Rice had Alyssa lead them to the gravesite. There was an audio recording capturing their journey through the woods as they came upon Elizabeth's remains in a too shallow grave. Alyssa first appeared in court on November 17, 2009. Even though she was only 15, the judge ruled that she would be tried as an adult due to the violent nature of her crime. She was originally charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action because she used the knife as a weapon. Despite her two recorded confessions, she pleaded not guilty. Her defense team filed a motion to suppress her confession, arguing that certain conduct during the interrogation violated Missouri law. They're referring to when the juvenile counselor stepped in. They stated that the counselor wasn't acting in Alyssa's best interest. She was acting more like the interrogator rather than her protector. Their motion was passed and Alyssa's confession was thrown out. As she awaited her next trial, Alyssa was held in custody without bail and was reported to have tried to harm herself multiple times. Sources say she tried to cut herself using her own fingernails. She was placed under surveillance and treated at a psychiatric center. Her defense also cited this as a reason why she should be given a different sentence. A defense attorney claimed, we're throwing away the child and we're signing a death sentence for Alyssa. She's not going to survive her time in the Cole County Jail. They also claimed that her medication could have affected her decision-making skills. Alyssa had been taking Prozac since 2007 and had started an increased dosage two weeks prior to Elizabeth's murder. While some arguments have been made that taking antidepressants can lead to violent or erratic behavior, there's actually no hard evidence that links the two. In contrast, the prosecutor, Mark Richardson, stated that because her murder was premeditated, Alyssa's case still met the legal requirements for a first-degree murder case. In fact, he urged the judge to sentence her to life in prison, plus 71 years to account for the years Elizabeth lost when she was slain. He said these sentences are appropriate and fit what happened to Elizabeth at the hands of a truly evil individual who strangled and stabbed an innocent child simply for the thrill of it. Around the same time as her trial, another case involving teen murderers was being looked at in the Supreme Court. The results of that case challenged the idea of charging minors of adult crimes and giving them life sentences without parole or the death penalty, calling it cruel and unusual punishment. Knowing that the Supreme Court was likely to rule that life sentences without the possibility of parole for juveniles is unconstitutional, and with the loss of Alyssa's confession, the prosecutor offered a plea deal plead guilty to a second-degree murder charge, in addition to the armed criminal action charge, which carried its own separate sentence, if she testified in court and confessed what she did to Elizabeth. Her defense agreed, and on January 30th, 2012, when Alyssa was 18 years old, she testified in court. As she stared out at Elizabeth's family and her own, she recounted the horrible things she did to Elizabeth Olton. Alyssa was sentenced to life in prison with a chance of parole for second-degree murder and an additional 30 years for armed criminal action. Under Missouri law, she must serve 35 years and five months before she'll be eligible for parole. 
Patricia, Elizabeth's mom, filed a lawsuit against Alyssa, demanding that she disclose any compensation from case coverage to Elizabeth's family. This means any books, movies, podcasts, videos like this one, or other material that turned a profit would benefit the victim's family, not the murderer. On February 8th, 2012, Alyssa gave one final statement. If I could give my life to bring her back, I would. I just wanna say I'm sorry for what happened. I'm so sorry. Only a few months after Alyssa's sentencing, the Supreme Court's decision passed, prohibiting judges from sentencing juveniles to life in prison without parole. So in 2014, Alyssa hired a new attorney and attempted to get a new sentencing, arguing that the pending Supreme Court decision wasn't considered during her plea deal in 2012. However, the judge dismissed her case. There's been controversy about this bill. Some argue that despite being a juvenile, if an offender is guilty of murder, they shouldn't be granted rights like parole. Others agree with the court's ruling, saying it's unfair to keep someone in prison for a crime they committed when they were a minor, when certain parts of their brain weren't developed and they weren't making mindful choices about their actions. In Alyssa's case, it certainly seemed like she had some mental health issues that may have clouded her judgment, but is it really fair to say she shouldn't be held responsible for so cruelly taking someone's life? I mentioned that Alyssa had been diagnosed with PTSD, and there had been other diagnoses of possible bipolar or borderline personality disorder. She had seen several psychiatrists and mental health care professionals, and during investigations, the authorities actually interviewed two professionals who had treated Alyssa in the past. Although she'd been described as psychologically damaged and severely emotionally disturbed, both professionals also said they hadn't suspected that Alyssa was capable of murder. Of course, she had a history of cutting and self-harm, but they had reason to believe Alyssa only had desires of inflicting pain on herself, not others but they couldn't have been more wrong. And when one of the psychiatrists was asked if they thought Alyssa was capable of distinguishing right from wrong, they said she definitely was. But if she had BPD, maybe there was a part of her that had a more sadistic desire to harm others. Or maybe it was all a ruse and Alyssa truly was a messed up kid with evil intentions. Over the years, this case has built a following. Several fan sites and groups have formed in support of Alyssa's release, saying that she was treated unfairly by the justice system since she was only 15 at the time. As of today, Alyssa remains in prison. In 2022, Missouri legislature passed a bill that allows convicted murderers who were under the age of 18 at the time of the crime to be paroled after only 15 years of incarceration. Alyssa has been granted a parole hearing and is scheduled to appear in court in July, 2024. But what do you think? Life without possibility of parole, should it be allowed? Should Alyssa be granted parole after nearly 15 years in prison? Can people really change? Not even just people, but individuals who've committed heinous crimes like Alyssa did. Let me know what you think in the comments. And thanks for tuning in to another episode of Killer Bites. I'm Brandy and stay safe out there. No one can imagine a single person in the world who would want to cause harm to Dee Dee Blanchard. She was a happy, loving, doting mother who would do anything in the world for Gypsy Rose. Gypsy Rose was her tiny, sick, disabled daughter who went through more hardships in her childhood than most people would see in their entire lives. That was why neighbors were so horrified to hear that the body of Dee Dee had been found brutally butchered with Gypsy nowhere in sight. But the discovery of Dee Dee was only the beginning. On June 14, 2015, sheriff deputies found the body of Claudine or Dee Dee Blanchard in her bed with no sign of her daughter Gypsy Rose anywhere. Now this was especially bad news because Gypsy was a teenager who suffered from leukemia, asthma, muscular dystrophy, and a slew of other chronic conditions. And according to her mom, Gypsy had the mental capacity of a seven-year-old. So the neighbors started warning police about how concerning it was that Gypsy was missing. They were like, Hey cops, this ain't right. Her wheelchair is here and her oxygen tank and she's supposed to be on a bunch of meds. Like this is bad. The whole community truly loved Dee Dee and Gypsy. They knew the duo came from a really rough background since they were Hurricane Katrina victims who had lost everything. Because of that, all their neighbors were super involved in the Blanchard's lives, always making sure they had everything they needed. I love how the neighbors care so much in this story. One of my neighbors, on the other hand, he didn't care at all. He would scream in the middle of the night, smash his own window, and try to break into my stairwell with a power drill. Thankfully, he doesn't live there anymore. 
So the neighbors initially called the cops for a welfare check because Gypsy and Dee Dee's shared Facebook account had some posts from earlier in the week that were super sus and said some pretty disturbing things. And yes, you heard that right, joint Facebook accounts. Because as you'll quickly learn, Dee Dee didn't let Gypsy do anything by herself. If you thought you had a helicopter mom, just wait until you hear what this woman did. Based on the sketchiness on their conjoined Facebook wall, the Blanchard's neighbors thought someone else had written them, and they speculated that whoever wrote them was the same person who harmed Dee Dee and took Gypsy. So this big manhunt begins to find this girl who, quite frankly, probably only had a few hours left if she hadn't had access to any of her care or meds. The cops were actually able to trace the Facebook status to a home computer in Wisconsin, and they were also tipped off by a neighbor to look into a man named Nicholas Godijan. The next day, the cops go to Wisconsin and enter the house, and there's Nicholas and Gypsy standing there, perfectly unharmed, and the cops are like, what the f And all of a sudden, the illusion was shattered. Gypsy wasn't sick, or at least not as sick as she claimed to be. Gypsy went on to tell the police that Nicholas was her boyfriend and that her mom had been forcing her to pretend to be sick her entire life. She said her mom would never let her be with Nicholas, so they had to make a plan. And what a plan she made. Police were so shook about how one woman could harm her own daughter so much as well as fool doctors, friends, and family for years into thinking she was sick. Cause like, this girl was sick. She had almost no teeth, no hair, and was severely underweight. She'd had multiple operations and surgeries throughout her young life as well, and as you probably know, doctors will only operate when they know they need to. Which means this woman was making her daughter sick and fooling them that well. But why? I'm sure you've heard of Munchausen by proxy before, but if you need a refresher, it's a psychological disorder and form of child abuse defined by a caregiver making up or causing injury to a person under their care. Psychologists still aren't actually sure what causes it, but they think it has to do with liking the extra attention and help from people and being seen as this devoted caretaker or saint. Psychologists also theorize that it can be a way of feeling like the person is in control of something when the rest of their life feels out of control. Basically, these parents just run around claiming their kids are sick for pity, money, and clout. Dee Dee has quickly become the poster child for Munchausen since her case went viral in 2015, because it was one of the first times the victim put a stop to their awful treatment in this way. As you can already probably tell, this was a very tricky case to handle, and it's still one of the more widely debated outcomes of a trial. But what was it in Dee Dee's life that turned her into this medical monster? I mean, apparently Dee Dee had a normal childhood, although relatives do say she had a habit of stealing from her family and sometimes got really upset when she didn't get her way. Then again, don't we all get upset when things don't go our way? I'm not sure about the whole stealing from the family part though. So one of the first jobs Dee Dee had was working as a nurse's aide. And it was around that time that her family expressed suspicion that she was responsible for her own mother's passing by not feeding her. I love how Dee Dee's relatives are like, yeah, she lived a normal childhood except for these seven red flags, and she also might have starved her own mother, but other than that, she was fine. When Dee Dee was 24, she got pregnant with her then 17-year-old boyfriend, Rod, who later became her husband. But Rod realized that he married Dee Dee for the wrong reason, so the two then separated. Dee Dee took Gypsy, and Rod agreed to pay monthly child support. It was at this point that Dee Dee started showing signs of Munchausen. When Gypsy was only three months old, Dee Dee was convinced her daughter had sleep apnea. She took her to the hospital for a bunch of tests and the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with her. But Dee Dee didn't like that answer. She was convinced that Gypsy had a bunch of other medical issues related to a chromosomal disorder, and she also claimed that her child had muscular dystrophy and needed a walker. To be clear, Gypsy has never actually been diagnosed with any of these illnesses and to everyone's knowledge was perfectly healthy. But Dee Dee was persistent, and she started to get clever. When Gypsy was seven, she fell off her grandpa's motorcycle and got a small scrape on her knee. After that, Dee Dee said the hospital gave Gypsy a wheelchair that she needed to use for a scrape on her knee. From that moment on, Dee Dee never let her daughter walk unassisted. As you can imagine, the fake illnesses didn't stop there. Suddenly, Dee Dee said Gypsy had developed hearing and vision problems. She even convinced doctors that her daughter had a drooling problem, so she literally got Gypsy's saliva glands removed from her mouth. Which like, what? And this woman was committed because according to Gypsy, Dee Dee would rub numbing gel all over her gums before she got to an appointment so that she couldn't stop drooling when they got there. Which is so beyond messed up. Wait, so how are doctors okay with doing all this for a perfectly normal little girl? Well, Dee Dee fudged a bunch of her daughter's medical records and got away with it by playing the pity card. So Gypsy and Dee Dee lived in New Orleans until Hurricane Katrina hit, but after that, they were relocated to Missouri, where Dee Dee was able to say all of their important medical documents had been lost in the hurricane, including Gypsy's birth certificate. 
Another important thing to note about Dee Dee was she was very charming. She would become all buddy-buddy with the doctors and use lingo from her nursing days, so they thought she knew exactly what she was talking about. Also, who wouldn't believe this doting mother when she rolls up with little Gypsy? I mean, Gypsy looked real sick, and Dee Dee had been handling it for so long that she just looked like any other mother taking care of her chronically ill kid. But the fake medical problems didn't end there. Dee Dee convinced the doctors that Gypsy also suffered from seizures. Despite the doctors never actually seeing Gypsy have a seizure, they were all like, okay, let's put her on anti-seizure medication. We trust you. And I'm sure you know this, but taking any medication for a condition you don't have is so dangerous. The mixture of the seizure medication, along with her not being able to salivate anymore, literally made her teeth fall out. Kids, please don't try that at home. And the same goes for adults and teens and elderly people. No one try this at home. Okay, so Gypsy was also bald and everyone assumed it was from chemotherapy treatments. But Gypsy told the cops that she had never had chemo. Apparently, her mom just told her they should shave her head because her hair was going to fall out eventually and they needed to stay on top of it. Yo, what? Mother Nature is fully capable of doing her thing with Gypsy's hair. We don't need Mother Dee Dee with a razor butting in. At one point, Dee Dee and Gypsy went to this pediatric neurologist and the doctor was super suspicious about Gypsy's muscular dystrophy, so he ordered a bunch of tests and scans and even did a muscle biopsy. But everything came back completely normal. The doctor had Gypsy there and was like, you can walk, you don't need that wheelchair. And he even tried to get Gypsy alone to walk around with him, but Dee Dee was like, absolutely not, how dare you, we're leaving. Yo, this woman is on another level. So that doctor ended up calling some of the past hospitals Dee Dee said they went to to ask them if any of Gypsy's tests showed signs of muscular dystrophy. The doctor he got in touch with said, yeah, that test came back negative. And after that, they stopped coming in. OMG, Dee Dee is cray cray. So immediately that doctor suspected that Dee Dee had Munchausen's, but of course she never went to see him again, probably because she knew he was onto her. Okay, let's all take this as a lesson that if your gut is telling you something is wrong, just tell like one other person. I feel like these doctors not acting on their suspicions or not wanting to insult a mother is one of the reasons Dee Dee was able to get away with her lies for so long. And not only was Gypsy's health a huge part of this case, but one of the things that really pissed people off was all the free stuff, government assistance, Disney World trips, and the attention the two of them got. Dee Dee often told people that Gypsy's dad wasn't in the picture. She said he was a user, an addict, and a terrible person who gave them nothing after the divorce, which of course was a bold-faced lie. Rod actually paid child support, like he sent them a couple thousand dollars every single month, and often said he wanted to visit, but Dee Dee would never tell him where they were. On top of that, their house, which was built by a nonprofit organization called Habitat for Humanity, had a ramp in the front for Gypsy and a giant jacuzzi for her treatments. The neighbors were also always helping Dee Dee and Gypsy with chores, groceries, cooking, and fundraisers. If you've heard of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, this girl got like all of her wishes and then some. Disney World trips, stays at the Ronald McDonald House, concerts with backstage passes, parades with Gypsy as the queen. I mean, Dee Dee was the ultimate momager who could finesse just about anything. Anything. So was Gypsy's life still all that bad? According to Gypsy, yes, absolutely it was. Gypsy told investigators that she wasn't allowed to go anywhere without her mom, and when she did go out in public, she always had to be holding her hand. Anytime Gypsy ever started talking too much or gave any indication that she wasn't as sick as she seemed, her mom would tightly squeeze her hand, which was code for STFU. Anytime this happened in public, Dee Dee would punish Gypsy when they got home by striking her with a coat hanger and sometimes tying Gypsy to her own bed. She was also never allowed to leave their house without the wheelchair, oxygen tube, and feeding tube. Yeah, Gypsy was getting fed the equivalent of a kid's Pediasure shake through a feeding tube well into her 20s. So you know, Disney World, but feeding tube and no teeth. Pros and cons for sure. Dee Dee was able to forge Gypsy's birth certificate before to make her seem younger, and then she kept up that lie by claiming it washed away in the hurricane. So no one really knew how old she was, including Gypsy herself. In an interview, Gypsy said that for 15 years, she was unsure of her own age. Just for clarity's sake, Gypsy was 24 years old in 2015 when the crime occurred. But at the time, everyone was under the assumption that she was a young teenager. Since Gypsy was coming into her womanhood, she started trying to meet guys online through different chat rooms and Christian singles groups. She also liked to meet guys at fantasy conventions. Gypsy loved dressing up as her favorite princesses and comic book characters and attending these big events where she could meet people just like her who love the same stuff as her, which was very freeing for Gypsy. 
One time at a sci-fi conference, Gypsy met up with a guy who she had been talking with online and she asked to run away with him. But as soon as the two got as far as his hotel, Dee Dee tracked them down and went off. She found them in the hotel together and started threatening the guy by saying Gypsy was underage and she was gonna get the cops involved and all this other crazy stuff. So the guy obviously dipped out of that situation. And that night when the two got home, Dee Dee smashed Gypsy's computer with a hammer and threatened to do the same thing to her fingers if she ever messaged people online again. On top of that, Dee Dee told Gypsy that she filed a report with the police claiming she was mentally incompetent, which meant that they would never believe her if she ran away. Those are the kinds of psychological games Dee Dee would play with her own daughter. I mean, it really is just horrible how much gaslighting and threatening was going on in that seemingly loving relationship. So as you can imagine, things were more strained than ever in the Blanchard abode, and Gypsy wanted out. She continued to find new ways to test her independence, and was actually able to sneak onto their home computer at night when her mom was catching some Z's. Yo, I can just imagine Gypsy firing up her CPAP machine and like tiptoeing into the living room to go and catch her a man's. I mean, power to you, Gypsy. We all have needs. Enter Nicholas Godijan. So Nicholas was a guy living in Wisconsin who had been chatting with Gypsy online for about three years. They both liked the same movies and were Christians. What more could you need in common? Oh, and Nicholas was also big into sci-fi conventions. Gypsy confided in Nicholas about her crazy mom, her whole fake sickness situation, and her longing to be free. Well, Nicholas wanted to be Gypsy's knight in shining armor, so the two hatched a rescue plan. In 2014, Gypsy paid to secretly fly Nicholas out to meet her. They had this whole plan that would involve bumping into each other at a local movie theater where he would meet Dee Dee, win her over, and live happily ever after with Gypsy. Gypsy was so excited about this plan that she couldn't keep it to herself. She ended up confiding in a neighbor and friend, Aaliyah, who told Gypsy that she didn't think it was a good idea. But Gypsy had already decided that this is what they were going to do. She even told Aaliyah they already had baby names picked out. So Gypsy and Nicholas decided they were going to go to the same screening of the new Cinderella movie. Gypsy said she would dress up as Cinderella so he could find her easily. Yes, I will be the girl in the big blue dress with the blonde wig, the wheelchair, and the overbearing mother. You can't miss me. Originally, the plan was to show up at the same time where Nicholas would hold the door open for Gypsy and Dee Dee and say a princess should never open her own door. But of course, that didn't exactly go as planned. Nicholas was late, so he didn't get to say his charming line he'd practiced. In fact, he ended up coming off as really awkward and creepy when he went up to them. Dee Dee just thought he was a rando and wanted nothing to do with him, so she quickly hustled Gypsy into the theater. Nicholas and Gypsy were super disappointed, so Gypsy left to go to the bathroom during the film, and Nicholas was able to follow her, and the two ended up doing the bippity boppity boo in that bathroom. After their plan failed, Nicholas had to return home, but before he did, the two vowed that the next time he visited, it would be to take his Cinderella away from her wicked stepmother for good. So Nicholas and Gypsy continued their online relationship, and things got real naughty real quick. Gypsy and Nicholas were into dressing up, role-playing, and bondage. Nicholas said he had an evil alter ego named Victor that would come out, and Nicholas could never cause harm to anyone, but Victor could. Gypsy liked to roleplay as someone named Ruby, and she too liked to go along with Victor's evil plans. During one of their phone sessions, Ruby showed Victor a bruise that she got from her wicked stepmother, and Victor promised that he would take out anyone that hurt her. And Gypsy, realizing this could be the only way she could finally escape her mother, is like, all right, bet. So in June of 2015, Nicholas went back to Missouri and waited. That night, when everyone went to bed, Nicholas came over and Gypsy gave him duct tape, gloves, and a large blade from the kitchen. Gypsy hid in the bathroom and covered her ears while Nicholas did the deed. And by deed, I mean he slashed Dee Dee in the back while she was in bed. Then Gypsy and Nicholas stole $4,000 and drove to a hotel where they stayed for two days. Gypsy suggested they hide the weapon, so the two mailed the blade back to Nicholas's house and then hopped on a Greyhound bus and set off for the Godijan digs. According to witnesses that saw the young couple together, the girl was wearing a cheap blonde wig and was walking unassisted. As if keeping the weapon and being seen in public while on the run wasn't enough, our knockoff Bonnie and Clyde decided they needed to tell the world about it. So after arriving home to Nicholas's house, Gypsy logged onto that good old Facebook account and wrote a status of four words that would begin the madness. That bitch is dead. Of course, after that, friends and neighbors went over to check on her, and when there was no response, they called the cops and discovered the scene inside. As the cops started questioning neighbors on who could have done this, Gypsy's friend and neighbor Aaliyah came forward and is like, BT dubs, the girl had an online boyfriend of three years and they talked about running away together. Maybe check him out. And as quickly as their life on the lam had begun, it was over. Nicholas's house was raided and both he and Gypsy were taken into custody. Gypsy's trial was of course a huge hit and immediately became sensationalized. People were super opinionated about who was at fault and what sort of punishment should be given. 
because on one hand you have this extremely sympathetic character who you just feel so bad for and it almost feels like she could claim self-defense after the years of pain and psychological torment inflicted on her. But on the other hand, even though she didn't do the actual slaying, she helped plan and assist Nicholas in doing so and even taunted friends and family with the foul Facebook status, so people were really torn. Aaliyah, Gypsy's neighbor and perhaps only friend, was shocked to find out that Gypsy was close to her in age. She said she always felt like an older sister to Gypsy and could barely comprehend how Gypsy and Dee Dee were keeping up this ruse for so long. During the trial, Gypsy showed up with a few inches of hair growing on her previously bald head and walked into the courtroom unassisted, not connected to any tubes or wires or anything either. Neighbors could hardly recognize her until she opened her mouth and spoke in her same squeaky, high-pitched voice. County Prosecutor Dan Patterson said he would not be seeking capital punishment for Nicholas or Gypsy because of the extraordinary unusualness of the case. In the end, Gypsy accepted a plea bargain and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Nicholas faced more severe charges because he was the instigator. He received life in prison without the possibility of parole. Gypsy is currently halfway through finishing out her 10 year sentence and she'll be out in 2026, just before her 33rd birthday. She'd been interviewed multiple times in prison and one thing she always says is that she is freer in prison than she ever was under the care of her mother. Gypsy's case was eye-opening for a lot of people and it helped shed light on a psychological disorder that almost no one knew existed before. After Gypsy's case hit the news, a lot of other people started coming forward with similar stories and shared their opinions on the case. So what do you think? Was Gypsy a cold-blooded villain who mercilessly planned the termination of her own mother? Or was she simply a victim doing the only thing she could do to escape her captor, who ultimately would have sent Gypsy to an early, unnecessary grave? Nicholas and Gypsy aren't together anymore. Nicholas said he would do anything for Gypsy. But Gypsy? She realized there is a whole world waiting out there for her when her dog days of prison are over. Thank you.